have eight winners. Unfortunately, two of the winners, the grand winners of 2020 and 2021, couldn't join us today, but we are going to watch their pre-recorded lecture later today. Uh, so I really hope that you are going to enjoy this day. Uh, it's going to be full of science and hopefully fun. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is Orsi Decker. She's the winner in 2020 in ecology and environment. She is from Hungary. She did her Bachelor of Science in Ötbosch Laurent University in Hungary, and then went for Master of Science in Amsterdam, University of Amsterdam in ecology and evolution. And then after that, she did her PhD in La Trobe University in Australia, where she is still working. So um, her thesis, very, very interesting thesis, uh, interest, uh, working on native digging mammals and the impact of these mammals, extinction of these mammals on the soil processes. Before I invite Orsi, I also want to tell you some secret, right? We are going to reveal a lot of secrets today about Orsi. So she likes to surround herself with animals. I think as any environment ecology scientist, she gave up on humanity. I guess. Uh, so she has two dogs, eight chicken, fish and snails, and almost a tamed magpie. And her dream is to train her dogs to sniff out the rare species of invertebrates. So, Orsi, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. I don't think I've had such an introduction before. Um, so, yeah, as, as um, it was mentioned, I flew here from the Australian summer and um, this is probably my first social gathering in the last one and a half years, so I might be a bit uh, nervous and let me know if I don't make any sense. <laughs> um, and I would like to thank you very much to fly, fly me here to this winter wonderland in Sweden. It's really, um, it's really beautiful. Um, so I probably don't really need to um, tell you much about ecosystem collapses and um, the global decline of biodiversity. And um, because of this, there is a growing interest in, um, in restoring e ecosystems. Even the UN um, named this 10 years, um, the decade of ecosystem restoration. So today I will talk about one way of helping nature, which is um, reintroducing fauna, regaining functions and restoring ecosystems. Um, but first I just wanted to show um, all these people I'm really grateful um, to because I couldn't have done any of the work I, I did um, without them. Um, and I studied and I work at La Trobe University, which is pretty, it's not a big and famous uni, but it's really nice. Um, it's in the middle of the woodland and uh, it's uh, doing a great effort in, um, in making itself sustainable and becoming net zero by 2029. And the other thing I think is really important is uh, it's the world's um, second uh, universe, world's second higher education institution in gender equality. So I think these are two pretty important things um, for a university. So let's talk about restoration. Um, restoration usually aims to increase biodiversity and then hoping that with biodiversity um, ecosystem functions will follow. And there's a passive type of restoration when, for example, you stop cropping land, let it be and just hope for the best. Or you can do more active restoration when you're planting trees and then hope that the birds will come. Um, but translocation and rewilding type of restoration is more active. So you're physically introducing species to an area where they might have been extinct from instead of waiting for them to just come naturally. Um, and I mainly study um, this type of rewilding when a species might be extinct from an area, but they are still um, they still occur in, in, the, in the broader um, geographic, uh, geographic range and you try and reintroduce them again um, where they are extinct from. 
And you can introduce them because you want to save them from extinction. But I'm mostly interested in um, introducing species to fulfill their ecological roles again. So the first half of my talk is about my PhD project, which um, is summarized in my essay. And it's rewilding with threatened digging mammals in Australia. And the second part of my talk is about much smaller things. It's about rewilding with invertebrates, and we like to call these invertebrates um, mini beasts in our in our lab. Um, but first, I would like to stop for a second to acknowledge the First Nations people um, of Australia, who cared for the land for uh, thousands of years. And I live and work in Melbourne, which is the stolen land of the Wurundjeri people. Um, and I pay my respect to their elders, um, past and present. Uh, and I did most of my work in South Eastern Australia. So you can see the long list of the traditional owners of the land I did my research on. But I spent most of my time on Kokata, Nongar and Barkindji country. Um, and of course, the, oops, the European colonization didn't only um, affect the indigenous people, but it had a huge impact on wildlife. So many plant and animal species faced extinction because of clearing land for agriculture and invasive um, predators from Europe, like the cats and foxes. Um, and my, and, oh, sorry. <laughs> so my project is uh, um, focusing on digging mammals. And they are, I think they are most, more, more well-known ones, like in the bottom, the echidnas or the wombat, which might be famous for its cubicle poops. Um, but there are some less known ones on top. They are the bilbies, um, numbats, bandicoots, um, and batongs. Uh, and they are probably less well known because they're quite rare, because they're been eaten by the cats and the foxes. So they are mostly extinct from mainland Australia, and they only survive in uh, predator-proof fenced reserves, like this one on the picture, and <laughs> they, they look like little nature prisons, really. Um, but that's what you have to do if you want to keep these small um, ding mammals alive. So I thought I'd show you what these digging mammals do in their free time, which is just digging lots of holes for food. And um, this is a greater bilby, which is just, just really busy all night long, just, um, yeah, just digging nonstop pretty much. And it's really hard to imagine that the loss of this digging activity doesn't have an effect on ecosystems, because you can see on the pictures, um, these are all uh, digging uh, mammal, uh, like the, the traces of the digging mammals, uh, and they just dig around constantly. So uh, they have, they must have really important roles in the ecosystem. So it's a little bit like tilling; they aerate the soil um, in those little holes. Uh, soil nutrients and soil moisture uh, accumulate, and they also distribute a lot of. Um, seeds and other resources like um, the potoro, which is that little elephant looking thing. Um, it's the original truffle hunter because it, it's, uh, it's really good at finding truffles and then distributing their spores wherever it goes. So we wanted to know what functions are lost from the ecosystem after the extinction of a whole suit of the ing mammals. And to answer the que this question, we used fenced re um, reintroduction areas where all these native mammals have been reintroduced uh, into fenced properties. So you can see, um, obviously, one side of the fence have the mammals, and the other side of the fence is just uh, yeah, they they are extinct from there. So we wanted to look at the big picture and um, and look at. Uh, reserves over the environmental gradient. So I was quite lucky to just drive around all across southern Australia and visit these beautiful um, reserves across the rainfall gradient. So the driest um, reserve was uh, uh, received, receives 160 mils per year and the, um, the wettest reserve receives almost 900 millimeters per year. And I, um, I took soil samples from inside and outside the reserves for two years. And I looked at 
microbe communities, microbe um, functions, a little bit of metagenomics, um, but I was mo most, most interested in soil processes. And in, in our lab, we also look at invertebrate communities and food webs. How, uh, how do they respond to the extinction of these native mammals? So what did we find? Let's, after um, analyzing more than 1,300 samples, did native um, digging mammals affect soil microbes and soil processes? Well, the answer is yes and yes. Um, we found that microbe diversity, for example, was higher on average in the reintroduction reserves. But this um, difference was only significant in the arid and the semi-arid areas. And I found a similar trend with soil available carbon, where on average the the uh, values were um, higher in the reintroduction reserves, but only significantly higher in arid and the semi-arid um, reserves. Um, so I took my sample, took, took my results, and um, tried to model a pre-Europe in Australia, imagining that all these digging mammals are still hopping around everywhere. They didn't go extinct. There's no cats and foxes. So you can see the rainfall map of Australia on, uh, on with the blue and my um, the reserves I visited. And so I predicted my, uh, based on my results, I just predicted for the pretty much the whole continent, how, how would it look like? But I didn't, um, I didn't predict for high rainfall areas like Tasmania and the Australian alpine uh, areas because I never went to such high rainfall areas. And I also never went to the tropics. Th that's why the northern bit of Australia is blank. So let's see what, what would it look like with and without the digging mammals. So you can see there's a huge difference between the two states of uh, pre-European and uh, current Australia uh, in the available carbon and in the surface soils. And there is even a bigger difference if you look at the soil layers, which are like 10, 15 centimeters below. And if you studied your rainfall map uh, caref carefully enough, you can see that, um, oh, I don't, I don't, I can't find the mouse, but. <laughs> it's on the screen. Oh, I just can't find it here. I just can't see it. No, it's a oh, combinations. <laughs> yes, thanks. Um, so you can find here is um, where these semi-arid and arid regions of the country are, and that's where the biggest difference is between um, between the two states. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this is probably where soil moisture and soil nutrients is the most important in for an ecosystem in the arid and semi-arid areas. So if we think about climate change, um, the world might become uh, more and more like Australia. So we really need to stop biodiversity loss and make smarter decisions about our future now. And rewilding is one way of doing it because rewilding will build resilience um, to ecosystems. And we saw the soil microbes and um, the functions change since the extinction of these mammals. But then it makes it it makes us wonder what else did we lose, which um, we might not know about. So um, it's quite easy to uh, study uh, and reintroduce these charismatic animals because who wouldn't want to invest in such cuddly, fluffy, cute animals to have on their reserves? However, invertebrates are doing probably 70% of ecosystem services. And they are the little things who run the world. But because um, they're understudied and probably less appealing, it's really hard to invest in the conservation of them. But looking at these pictures, you don't really have to convince me that they are the best. Um, so that's why we, uh, we wanted to test if we can reintroduce um, invertebrates and soil fauna to degraded lands such as agricultural um, windbreaks. And these windbreaks are um, just basically strips of native trees which are left um, to just grow. So there's, um, there's no cropping or no grazing on those little areas, which you can see, for example, here. But because this patch of native veg vegetation is pretty much in, a, in the middle of a biological desert, 
um, probably invertebrates would find it quite hard to make their uh, find it hard to make their way into these um, native um, native patches of land. So we thought maybe we could help them. So we went to nearby remnant forest sites and um, collected a whole heap of uh, litter and surface soil into big bags and then dumped it all to these um, to these uh, strips of trees and then uh, see what happened. But we also left um, a couple of areas without these uh, litter transplants to then we can compare what um, what changed and. There's a lots of there's lots of things we were testing and it, the it's still we are still collecting samples and um and continuing the experiment but for example um you can see it changed the um, invertebrate richness a little bit so if the bars are moving to the right <laughs> it means that um it means that our transplants worked and the first this um the bar, the, this peach color bar is the baseline, so before those transplants. And then from there, the bars move to the right, it means um, the transplants increased in richness. So you can see beetles and uh, two types of mite richness increased since the um, not, yeah, transplants. Um, but the colambulans don't really seem to care about our transplants very much. Maybe they are quite mobile, so they don't need our help. Um, so, we do think that litter and soil transplants might aid degraded areas in returning invertebrates and their functions, but we are still collecting samples, so many more results could follow. And I thought I, um, I could finish off with another possible application of this rewilding ID, um, which is about helping nature after um, natural disturbances like fire. So Australia experienced the unprecedented fire season in 2019 and 2020, which was a result of a long drought and really hot temperatures. Um, and these black summer bushfires affected an area bigger than England and killed almost 50% of Gondwana rainforest in southern Australia. Um, and there was uh, estimated billions, millions of vertebrates uh, killed, and we can't even think of how many invertebrates um, died in this one single fire event. So we wanted to know if we could aid the sever severely burnt um, forest with these litter transplants. So one thing I was looking at was lens, native land snails, and not surprisingly, native land, steel, land snail occurrence um, significantly decreased with the burn severity. Um, but their occurrence was uh, increasing with unburned little patches of, of the area within the fire footprint. So probably refuges like big vet, big vet logs are quite important in these invertebrate survival and even probably so small member survival as well. And probably the best would have been if uh, we'd, we could have done the whole heap of uh, logs and uh, structures, like woody structures as refugees for invertebrates and small inter invertebrates before the fire, but of course you can't do that. So at the moment we are creating these post hoc um, refugees for the um, surviving invertebrates because uh, as you can see on this middle picture the burnt rainforest floor don't really have anything to offer to anything and uh, there's no resources and there's no refugees for invertebrates there so we thought invertebrates could use a little help from their friends um, and this on this picture you can see these really big bags we were dragging along from unburnt rainforest floors to um, to the burnt rainforest and scatter it around to to just boost um, boost the complexity of the habitat and this is also still ongoing this project so I can't really show you any results but um, we are hoping that we can help these invertebrates to recolonize after such catastrophic um, disturbances so if you zoned out a little bit this morning, that's okay, because um, here is um, is my the summary of my talk. So reintroducing native fauna will um, restore ecosystem functions and 
I think, increase resilience to climate change. And refugees and native habitat is probably key for wildlife to um, survive and recover after disturbances, let them be natural or, um, or uh, not natural. And that was my talk, and that's my favorite snail on this log. And yeah, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Orsi, for this insightful talk. So, uh, questions for Orsi? I think maybe I can start. Um, so, you said in pre-European times mm. there were no foxes. Why, why did people bring foxes and cats with them? And these are wild animals, I believe. Yeah, mainly for uh, hunting. So, yeah. So, they brought rabbits for hunting, but there's too much rabbits. So then they bought foxes to get rid of rabbits, but then they didn't get rid of any of them, and they just got rid of the native um, animals. So yeah, it's just for pleasure. <laughs> yeah. And for this uh, fence system, as you called nature prison, <laughs> yeah. uh, how does it really stop the digging animals? It, um, it has a skirt underground. Okay. okay. So it goes underground and then has a skirt and it has a floppy top, so if anything climbs it, it just like flops back, I so see. it can't go. Yeah. Really a prison. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Questions for Orsi? Please. Um, so, um, so how do you train your dog to sniff uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the special in, invertebrates? It's pretty easy, actually. It's um, yeah, it's it's a it's a, I think there's a, there's this new new era of ecosystem of ecology where you can you know use dogs to sniff out things or or just use um, environmental DNA to find species because it's really it's extremely hard to find. For example, land snails. I I couldn't believe it how 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 long we had to go and look for them. And it's it's the same for other invertebrates. So it's so I always thought, oh, it would be so easy to just have a dog and then they, you know, they can just say, this is where you have to dig your snail out and I don't have to do um, useless rounds of it. And yeah, it's really easy to, um, it's called nose work. So I, yeah, I, I told my dog to sniff out um, specific scents in the garden. But um, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's really useful, and like for example, they use dogs to find injured wildlife after the fires. So, like the, those famous burnt koalas, like they just let let the dogs and uh, they just sniff the the poop of the koala and just say here here it is. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, it's pretty much the same as teaching any tricks really. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so we have al always been taught in schools that the ecological system in Australia is very delicate. So it's on a very delicate balance and anything foreign that you introduce may harm its ecological system. So when you go into Australia, they check the bottom of your shoes to remove yeah. any soil and stuff like that. So when you kind of introduce this uh, invertebrates, even though it's kind of like native uh, invertebrates, uh, but you kind of introduce them to an already kind of weak ecosystem, how do you make sure that this introduction of uh, like much higher number of invertebrates uh, won't actually uh, make a negative effect on the delicate yeah. system? Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I don't know. It's <laughs> it's uh, it's really um, there are always different rules apply for invertebrates and vertebrates. So there's less. <coughs> it's uh, it considered less dangerous to move invertebrates around, but um, but in these degraded areas, <coughs> you can't. It's already so bad. You can't really do any any harm because um, the problem is that it's revegetated, but there's only trees. There's no understory. There's no. There's very little litter layer. The soil is really dry. Um, so there's there's not much for anything really to to live in and uh, and first we we wanted to just create this you know this complexity of of the understory where you can get 
you know, litter accumulation, logs, and just um, like what you would see in a forest. And uh, but then we realized that there's so many flightless invertebrates who just can't just can't get there. Even though if you create a great habitat, they just still can't get there because they'd have to go through these kilometers and kilometers of uh, of pastures with just cows and um, and uh, and and uh, pasture grasses. So so then we started to look at actually collecting invertebrates and and look um, what will go and. I think the sad thing is that those degraded places they're still they're already they're full of introduced invertebrates like Portuguese millipedes are pretty abundant because because they're the only ones who can deal with such degraded areas so and if you go to remnant forests you if you go from the edges to the middle it's it's pretty it's not really likely to find um introduced invertebrate so it's uh it's a bit tricky because yeah as you said it's it's hard to tell but those the level of degradation is so high that you, you just, yeah you, you just can't really do any any more harm to it yeah thank you i think for the sake of time yeah, thank um thank you very much for this insight talk again <laughs> so our next speaker is uh, Lin Meng, who is the grand winner of 2021. As I said previously, she's not going to be here today, but we are going to have a pre-recorded <laughs> talk. But first, I'd like to still introduce Lin Meng. She finished her Bachelor of Science in Shenyang University, China, and Master of Science in Chinese Academy of Meteorological Sciences. She did PhD in Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, US, where she's still currently working. And her thesis focused on how urban environment alters plant life around it. Hello, everyone. My name is Lin Meng. Today, I will present to you why I care about tree greening and how urban environments trick trees into thinking spring arrives earlier. I grew up in Northeast China, and spring is my favorite season. Right after the cold of winter, everything is just beginning to wake up and shows its color. The blossom of yellow winter jasmine, pink peach, and white apricot made every day in spring an exciting adventure for me. In 2015, I was in Beijing a city that is particularly beautiful in the springtime when thousands of cherry trees bloom. My friend and I had planned to go see the cherry blossom in the Central Park. Unexpectedly, a freezing event occurred the day before we went, and all we could see the next day was flowers, frozen eyes, and a lot of dead flowers. This is not accidental event. Climate warming makes trees confused and places them at risk. This inspired me to think, what affects the timing of tree greening in cities? It's the motivation I committed to conduct research on tree greening. Trees do not have watches or calendars, but they seem to know when spring arrives better than we do. The timing of seasonal biological events, such as when trees leaf out, flowers open, and leaves turn yellow, is called phenology. Phenology involves incredibly complex processes. And temperature and daylands have been identified as critical environmental cues for trees to track time. We see vibrant green leaves of trees emerge when the days get warmer and longer in spring. I study phenology 
because climate warming has shifted technology across the whole world, having cascading ecosystem effects, such as affecting allergy season, carbon cycling, and plant pollinator matchup. But that's not the whole story. Complex urban environments pose additional challenges for trees. Cities are one to three degrees warmer than the nearby countryside, a phenomenon known as the urban heat island effect. We have artificial light from advertising billboards, buildings, public street light, and vehicles. These artificial light illuminate the night in cities, shifting the regular day-night cycle that plants rely on. I wonder how these changes in urban environment affect tree greening. To answer this question, I compared the timing of spring green updates in urban versus rural areas in the 85 largest cities in the US using satellite data. I found spring green up occurred six days earlier in urban area compared to rural areas on average. This six day difference was mainly caused by warmer urban temperatures, which was on average 1.3 degree warmer than rural temperatures. In addition, I found that the changes in urban greening was less sensitive to temperature variations. In other words, under climate warming, both urban greening and rural greening shift earlier but urban greening shifts earlier at a slower rate. Why? Because of the warmer winter in cities. Urban winter is too warm for trees. The urban trees were not chilled enough in winter, so they were less responsive when days warmed up in spring. As trees start to turn green earlier and the climate warming and the urban warming, the green up days will consequently occur in shorter days because we have short days in winter and long days in summer. And it's unclear whether this shortened day length will slow down the early shift of spring green up. To answer this question, we need to disentangle the effect of temperature and day lens on phenology. This is very challenging because temperature and day lengths frequently change in similar ways across latitude and day of year. Winters are cold and also have short days, and summer days are warm and long. I found the Northern European Alps has very unique topography that can serve as an ideal natural laboratory to answer this question. Across the Alps, elevation decreases as latitude increases, so we get a relatively uniform temperature distribution. At the same time, day lengths do change across latitude. So in this region, I used technology data from Pan-European Phenological Network and examines the effect of day lengths on spring green up across latitude. I found spring greening showed a significant change across day lengths represented by latitude, and the shortened day lengths slowed down the earlier trend of spring greening and the climate warming. <coughs> Applying this funding in the context of cities I wonder whether artificial light serve as extended day lens and thereby mitigating the day lens constraint on earlier green up. I used a recently released artificial light satellite product, NASA Black Marble, and technology data from USA National Phenology Network. 
I compare technology with and without artificial light by control temperature. I found the intense artificial light caused earlier spring greening and later autumn leaf cooling. Basically, we have a longer growing season in cities. My research suggests that we expect earlier spring greening and longer growing season in cities going forward. That means plants will absorb more carbon dioxide and improve air quality. That's a good news. But on the other hand, leafing earlier could subject plants to risk of late spring frost. And early spring greening could also result in a mismatch in the timing for pollinators and a shift in pollen season. So it's really an open question whether the shifting technology is a net gain or loss for the ecosystem. Surrounded by buildings and traffic, urban trees have long been neglected as a part of nature. However, the timing of urban tree greening actually opens a window to discovering the environment we live in and our love of nature. So I propose after today's meeting, let's go outside and take a walk. Trees do talk to us if we stop long enough to listen. Thank you, Science and Sun Life Lab for the award. Thanks for my advisor, mentors, and collaborators who have helped me along the way. Thanks to my funding source, Iowa State, NASA, Oak Creek National Lab, and Berkeley Lab for funding me to do exciting research. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. I'd like to thank Lynn. Uh, we are sorry that she's not going to be here, so we're not going to have questions. And please don't go out, it's really cold. <laughs> um, so let me introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is uh, Dasha Nelidova. She is the winner of 2020 in molecular medicine. She is from New Zealand, where she did her Bachelor of Science in Medicine, Auckland. And then she moved to Switzerland for her PhD in neurobiology at FMI Switzerland. Currently, she is working at the Institute of Molecular and Clinical Ophthalmology. In her thesis, she studied by using TRP channels the activation of retinal cells with near infrared light in a blind animal models and ex vivo human retina. So, before I invite her to the stage, also a few facts about her. She loves dancing, and especially ballroom dancing, and in her free time, she actually teaches dancing as well also to scientists. So, Dasha, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation to speak here today on behalf of our entire team, I wanted to say thank you to Science, to SciLife Lab, and to our sponsors. It is an absolute pleasure to speak here today. So this will be a story about light, gold, snakes, and the retina. And it starts in 2010. In 2010, a beautiful paper was published. The subject of that paper was optogenetics, a new kind of gene therapy. And the aim was to show that the optogenetic technique can also be used to restore vision in blind mice with retinitis pigmentosa, a rare aggressive inherited type of retinal degeneration. 
It then took our field a few more years to get to the next stage because the next stage was clinical, a case report. This time, a different optogenetic sensor was targeted to the retina of a blind patient who had advanced retinitis pigmentosa and minimal remaining vision. Because of technical reasons, the sensor was actually targeted to the very last layer of the retina, this black so-called ganglion cell layer, which is the layer that projects to the brain, and not the first layer of the retina, the photoreceptor layer, which is the layer normally responsible for sensing light and the layer actually affected by the disease. Nevertheless, the researchers from Basel, Paris, and a center in the United States were able to show that the patient could perceive different objects using the treated eye while also wearing specially designed eye goggles. Optogenetics is a technology that sensitizes neurons to different wavelengths of visible light by transfer of single genes that code for light-sensitive proteins. The genes originate in simple organisms, green algae or bacteria, and are then transferred to strategically important retinal cell types using viruses or virus-like particles. Nine times out of 10, we use something called an adeno-associated virus, which is a benign FDA-approved transfer agent. For the optogenetic system to work in a patient, the patient also has to wear specially designed eye goggles. <laughs> These capture the visual scene using video camera technologies, convert the scene into an image composed entirely of one single predetermined wavelength, turn up image intensity quite a bit, and then project this high intensity image onto the retina, onto the optogenetically transduced retinal region, using a system of several thousand micromirrors. The mirrors are in a rectangular array. Each would roughly correspond to a single image pixel. And then by flicking the mirrors on and off very quickly, and thereby adjusting how much light is allowed to go through, image patterns and light intensity grayscales can be produced. A key issue with the optogenetic approach is that this technology requires bright, extremely bright visible light in order to activate. In practice, this would mean flooding the human eye with light, leading to retinal photobleaching, to the sensation of glare, to saturated photoreceptor responses, all of this overall interfering with whatever vision the patient has remaining. Since most of our patients, um, more than 90%, including patients with age-related macular degeneration, still have some degree of remaining visual function, which should be preserved, there was strong pressure in our field to develop a new class of technology. We described a new method using near-infrared, nanogenetic light sensors designed to be compatible with remaining vision for the patient group with incomplete or regional retinal degeneration such as macular degeneration. And the advantage of near-infrared is twofold. First, in most species, including humans, vision is sensitive to electromagnetic radiation that is in a pretty narrow band, roughly 400 to 700 nanometers. 
and near infrared light at around 900 nanometers is outside this window, meaning that we can deliver the therapy and restore vision in the affected retinal region without interfering with remaining vision. And second, water absorption of near infrared wavelengths is low, on par with water absorption of the visible spectrum and lower than water absorption of longer wavelength infrared radiation. Since cells and tissues are mostly water, this means a better safety profile as the near-infrared pulse is traveling through the eye to reach the retina. There are actually not too many examples in nature of animals that can sense these longer wavelengths, but some of the more exotic species can see the world in two different ways. Like humans, certain snakes can use their eyes to detect wavelengths of the visible spectrum. In addition, some of these species can also generate thermal images. These snakes detect long wavelength infrared light using temperature sensitive TRP cation channels that are expressed in a specialized pit organ. This is a shallow depression, a concavity about halfway between the eye and the nose. Importantly, thermal and visible spectrum images then superimpose within the brain, presumably enabling the animals to react to the environment with greater precision than what is possible using just one single image. It's thought, based on some work done in the 70s, that snakes can switch back and forth between the two imaging systems, or else use both simultaneously. It is a little bit unfortunate that the human visual system does not have a similar inbuilt backup plan, but it is possible uh, to borrow a few ideas from nature. We cannot use long wavelength infrared light for the human eye because there is a risk of overheating the ocular tissues. We can use near infrared light because it's cooler, though the same feature makes it an inefficient activator of TRP channels. To develop an efficient near infrared light detector, for retinal cell types, we engineered a dual system consisting of a genetic and a nanomaterial component. The genetic component did consist of TRP channels, but engineered to incorporate an extracellular protein epitope tag shown in orange that was then recognized by a specific anti-tag antibody. The nanomaterial component consisted of gold nanorods conjugated to antibodies against the epitope. This system uses surface plasmon resonance and electron oscillation along the nanorod surface for heat transfer. Gold nanorods serve as antennas for near-infrared light and convert light into a certain amount of local heat, which opens TRP channels, causing current to flow through the channel, through the cell, and through the retina. Expression of this nanogenetic light sensor in retinal cone photoreceptors rendered blind mouse retinas near infrared light sensitive. Cone photoreceptors representing retinal input and ganglion cells representing retinal output responded vigorously to near infrared light. Importantly, these responses propagated from the retina to the brain, which allowed treated animals to perform simple behavioral tasks. In this task, a mouse is taking a drink of water every time a near-infrared pulse is uh, delivered to the eye. In complementary experiments, we confirmed that near-infrared light 
neither activated healthy wild-type photoreceptors nor affected their subsequent visible light responses. By using slightly longer nanorods, we tuned near-infrared vision to another near-infrared wavelength, going from 915 nanometers to 980 nanometers. Wavelength tuning is important for several reasons, two of which are certain wavelengths might be better tolerated by patients than others, and maximum permissible light exposures or light doses for the human eye depend on the wavelength. To address temperature, safety aspects of raising temperatures at the back of the eye, two solutions might be considered. First, a variety of TIP channels exist in nature, and more variants can potentially be made by mutagenesis. Selecting a channel with a lower thermal threshold will decrease the temperature that has to be generated at the level of the nanorod. And second, an alternative approach would be to take near-infrared light but move in the other direction, making the new research question, can near-infrared light be used to bring temperatures down? This is counterintuitive, but in principle should be possible. This would be a beautiful solution, but complex. Complexity in translation is a disadvantage. In our paper, we opted for the former, for the first approach. We took TRPA channels from the Texas rat snake because of their lower thermal thresholds, around 39 degrees, and compared to mammalian TRPV channels activated at around 43 degrees Celsius, we saw that mice with a snake channel were better able to perform behavioral tasks when lights were dimmed, indicating an improvement in sensitivity of the sensor. Finally, we targeted our nanogenetic sensor to photoreceptors of adult, human, ex vivo retinal explants. To do this particular experiment, we had previously developed a whole cocktail of molecules that could keep human retinas intact, ex vivo, for up to 10 weeks post-mortem, giving us enough time for gene expression to take hold. We recorded responses to near-infrared light and saw fast, strong activation of human photoreceptors and all the downstream neurons, including ganglion cells. Taken together, our experiments provide proof of principle for potential therapeutic translation. Light intensities required to drive our nanogenetic system met existing safety standards that specify exposure limits for the human eye and we further demonstrated that components of the sensor might be exchanged with predictable final outcomes. In the future, targeted central repair might allow an island of near-infrared sensitivity to be built, one that is surrounded by an annulus of natural vision. Ultimately, by exchanging the light source that is incorporated into their eye goggles, the patient might be able to self-select the region of the electromagnetic spectrum that is most useful to view the external world, a decision that's guided by the state of their retina and ambient light conditions. Thank you very much for your attention today. Thanks very much, Dasha. Fantastic. So, questions for Dasha? Maybe I can start again. Sure. Um, what is the range of the power of the near infrared you're using? 
uh, at the moment, uh, our intensities are at about 10 to the 18 photons per square centimeter of the retina per second. And we are actively trying, uh, working on bringing this down even further. And this actually does still cause heating on the retina? Yes, a pre-specified amount, which you can titrate by exchanging components of mm -hmm. the nanogenetic sensor. Mm -hmm. There's a question. Yes. Was it the kinetics of the response? Like I imagine if it's involving heat transport, even if it's with these nanorods, it's much slower than optogenetics, which is just activating a light or opening a light-gated ion channel. So if you're having to heat up these rods and then cool them down and then heat them up again, what's, what's the kinetics of the visual response? It, 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 it's reasonably fast. So fast to turn on and fast to uh, turn off. The exact kinetics depend on um, how heat diffusion is controlled. So this, again, depends on the exact components uh, of the nanogenetic sensor. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, you bring the genetic material inside the cells with the adenovirus uh, stuff, but uh, the gold particles, uh, how do you get them inside the cells? Maybe I didn't get that. Uh, they stay outside the cell. So we inject them into this potential space, which is... Uh, behind the retina, so we sandwich them by the injection method between the retina and the next layer of the eye, and they stay outside uh, the cell. Mm. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Thank Rasha. Much. So now... <laughs> now we are going to have 25 minutes break. We are going to be here like five past eleven.
Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are going to continue with our molecular medicine section. So our next speaker is Wen Fei Sun, the winner of 2021 in molecular medicine. He's from China, and he did his Bachelor of Science in China Pharmaceutical University, Master of Science in Columbia University, and PhD at ETH Zurich. Currently, he's a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University, and his thesis focused on the role of brown adipose tissue on ob obesity. And something that you, has, you have to know about Wen Fei, really interesting fact, he cannot play video games. <laughs> he tried really hard, especially during pandemic. Didn't get the crack of it. So it's really good to have you here. Wen Fei, please. Uh, thank you, Erdich, for the interesting introduction. Actually, I can play some video games, like Dota. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, so uh, I'm Wen Fei, and uh, thanks to Science and the Sci, Sci Life Lab, it's really my great honor to be here to present my doctoral work, and that is about using fat as a weapon against obesity. Uh, sounds funny, right? Uh, so despite a lot, of, uh, lots of uncertainties these days, our world has kept gaining weight uh, since the 1970s, and currently, uh, according to the most recent report there's about 13% of the adults, human beings, are considered as obese. And that's, uh, we, we, we classify them as body mass index over 30. Uh, so it, obesity is actually related to, uh, highly related, uh, related to uh, metabolic di uh, diseases like type 2 diabetes and also a certain type of cardiovascular diseases like stroke, and which leads to a huge medical expense. It's over about... $200 billion per year in the United States alone. So we need some, some uh, strategy to, to get, uh, get rid of it. And when we talk about obese, one of the main observations that we have is that we have too much fat tissue. And actually, there's uh, two types of fat tissues in our body. One is the white adipose tissue, which, is, uh, which stores excessive energy in the form of uh, fatty acid. And as we can see uh, in the left here, that these cells are specialized in uh, keep their fat, uh, fat inside their cells. So it's a huge lipid droplet and uh, with very limited amount of mitochondria on the site. And on the other hand, we have also the brown edible site. That, that's a specialized cell type that could uh, use their stored energy uh, to, to produce heat uh, in, uh, in a way that we can keep our body warm. And in these cells, we have a sm much smaller lipid droplets, which have, uh, so the cell would have much uh, better access to the fatty acid. So, and also the cells would have very uh, large amount of mitochondria to produ uh, producing heat. And recent studies show that these two types of cells could interconvert in different conditions. So that uh, opens the door that we, uh, so if we uh, promote white adipocyte to be brown, and we have a chance to restore the anti balance without exercise or without. Uh, and, and we can eat whatever we like. So uh, this is really attractive uh, from pharmaceutical target, but actually it's not that trivial because uh, we only have like five to 10% people are, have actual brown fat. So it's really difficult to, to use this strategy to promote energy uh, expenditure. And luckily, we have a good method called PET-CT, which, uh, which is usually used for uh, cancer metastasis uh, 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 detection, which uh, use, uh, uh, and, and because brown fat takes up glucose as good as uh, tumor cells, so we have a chance to detect this uh, specialized uh, type of tissue uh, by uh, PET-CT scans. And after uh, analyzing over 8,000 PET-CT scans in the, uh, available in the University Hospital in Zurich, we found a very interesting pattern that when uh, the individuals was conceived in the winter time, uh, where uh, the month is that uh, the temperature is below zero or lower, and we found in these month in these months the, the the patients uh, when the patients were conceived in these months they had much higher chance of high brown fat, and uh, when the patients were conceived in the summertime they have much lower chance to have brown fat. It is a very interesting correlation, but considering that it's a transgenerational regulation and also it's a retrospective analysis that a lot of confounders could be involved. So we need to be careful about these correlations. So we, we, we're trying to use a, a mouse model 
that we can control everything that and we could uh, potentially uh, make a causal re a relationship between these two factors. Uh, so in our, in our uh, mouse model, we have, uh, all, so these are all white type black six mice. So we have three groups. The first is the control that both of, of the parents were in room temperature uh, all their life. And in the maternal cold group, uh, the mother was cold exposed before mating. And in the paternal cold group, the father was cold exposed before mating. And we took the offsprings for analysis. And uh, when the pup was born, I took a, uh, I used a thermal camera to check their surface temperature. And we found when the uh, pups were coming from a paternal cold uh, background, they would have much higher surface temperature than the control group. And uh, they also express much higher uh, thermogenic protein called UCP1. It's short for uncoupled, uncoupling protein one that is a specialized protein uh, that can sh uh, short, cut, uh, sh uh, short skirt their mitochondria in the membrane. And instead of making uh, ATPs, uh, this uh, protein can make heat instead of making ATP. So, so UCP1 is highly regulated in the uh, brown fat or paternal code group, but not in the control group or in the maternal code group. And we are wondering why does this happen? And because the father could only uh, trans transmit the sperm to the offsprings, and so it has to be happening in the sperm. So we took their sperm and, do, and we did uh, DNA methylation sequencing. And we found on a global level, the DNA methylation pattern from the uh, code exposed animal and versus a control animal is quite different. And uh, of course, we're trying to figure out what are on a molecular level, what, are, well, uh, what pathways are different. So we did a pathway analysis, which, which reveals at least two major pathways were hypermethylated. One is expected as, as uh, we would think that it's, uh, it's related to metabolic process because it's brown fat, of course, it's related to um, metabolism. But uh, in with the blue arrow, we can see it's also involved, highly involved with the neurogenesis pathways, which is we, didn't, uh, we, wouldn't, we would never expect. And, and since uh, brown fat is highly innovated by adrenergic signaling, and we think probably there are some uh, adrenergic neurofibers are more abundant in the brown fat. So we uh, quantified their tyrosine hydroxylase uh, expression, which is a, uh, a, rich a rich limiting step to produce uh, norepinephrine. And we found in the paternal color group, there's more uh, of these fibers and, uh, than the control group. So we're trying to uh, functionally uh, relate this finding. So we used uh, microdialysis approach that we put a probe into the brown tissue of the mice and we can constantly measure their norepinephrine, norepinephrine uh, uh, release. And we found that when the mice, the pups were giving cold exposure, uh, as we can see from uh, in, in the uh, blue window, uh, both of the groups would have much higher norepinephrine uh, induction, but the paternal color group would have much higher and much rapid response to a cold. So they release much uh, higher amount of norepinephrine uh, and release much faster. And so as a summary, we found that uh, paternal code uh, exposure programs a hyperactive brown fat in the offspring through their sperm and spe uh, specifically through improve their butt innovation. And let's move to another story that I'm more interested about. It's about we identify a new cell type in within the brown edible tissue that could regulate systemic metabolism. So brown tissue is, is actually a very dynamic uh, type of tissue when in room temperature, we have the tissue looks like this, and uh, with some cells are UCP1 positive and some of them are not, and they have uh, medium-sized lipid droplets. But when the animal was kept in eight degree, the cells are, uh, looks mu um, much condensed and uh, the lipid droplets are much uh, smaller and uh, their UCP1 expression is, is much higher. Uh, this suggests that, uh, that this tissue is on fire. They are, they are putting a huge amount of heat to, produce, uh, to keep their uh, body temperature warm. And when the animal was kept in 30 degrees, and uh, the thermogenesis is not really needed in this case. So the brown fat actually becoming a whitish phenotype. So the cells uh, have much larger lipid droplets and uh, the UCP1 expression is uh, very minimum. And to figure out how these cells are migrating between uh, the white phenotype to a, uh, cold, uh, to a brown phenotype, we did single nucleus RNA sequencing. And we found there's a, about 10 subtypes of brown edible cells within the brown fat of mouse. Of mouse. And uh, all the cells are looks 
quite different, but there's one cell type uh, is most interesting to us is that uh, the red cells on the bottom. This cell is conserved in all three conditions. And uh, plus, uh, in higher temperature, this, the, the percentage of the cells is increased from 2 to 3% to 4% and until 8% for the thermonutrient thermo conditions. And this type of cells is, uh, uh, express an N kind of, uh, a marker that usually not exists in, brown, uh, in edible sites called C uh, CYB2E1 and ALDH1E1. So we're trying to figure out what are these genes to do uh, in the edible sites. Uh, so we use a viral approach to knock down ALDH1E1 specifically in the edible sites of brown edible tissue. And we found that the ALDH1E1 knockdown mice have much higher surface temperature than the control animal. And their brown cells is much more uh, induced with the uh, histology standing. And we are wondering how does ALDH1E1 would uh, lead to a hyperactive brown fat? Uh, we, we used a metabolic approach to check the medium of the cell culture that the cells was knocked down with ALDH1E1 or uh, with a control. And we found that the acetate in the medium was uh, re reduced by half. And acetate is a well-known signaling molecule that has mo uh, multiple roles. One of them is to in to inhibit lipolysis. And to find uh, what does acetate know, uh, do in, in, uh, in vivo, we use a pump system that we can deliver directly the acetate to the one part of the brown fat. And uh, after one week of, of delivery, we found in, in the lobe that the uh, acetate was, was, uh, was infused. The tissue looks like whitish compared to the other part of the brown fat. This suggests uh, uh, dysfunction of the thermogenesis uh, tissue. And uh, if we look at closer, uh, the cells acquire a whitish phenotype that all the uh, lipid droplets are larger and uh, the UCP1 expansion uh, is also lower. So to sum up, we found a cell type that expresses uh, CYP2E1 and uh, ALDH1E1 and that can regulate brown adipose tissue function through the acetate signaling. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all the members of Wolfram Lab, and uh, uh, with special thanks to my advisor, Christian Wolfram, and he is really supportive to my research, and uh, he supports whatever I do to, to, to about the brown fat. And also, I would like to thank my co-advisor, Viv Ragif, uh, for her expertise in single-cell RNA sequencing, and as well as our collaborator, Wolf Haik, for DNA, sequencing, uh, DNA methylation sequencing. Thank you. I would like to take questions. Thank you, Wenfei. So I think I'll start again. Uh, when you say it's a new cell type, is it, is it a new cell type or is it the same cell with different expression, just a few genes? Good question. And uh, uh, for the single cell field, I think the state and the cell type it could never be resolved easily. And in my it, uh, in my impression that this cell looks like a distinct cell type because they, they express different genes, of course, and they are constantly different from other cells. And uh, the difference is quite stable in different conditions. And you always can find a uh, secret type of cells with different genetic expression, and uh, you, you can always see them. So any chance to isolate them and look in detail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. We isolate them by fact sorting. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, these cells are not really thermogenic active. Okay. Questions for Wenfei? My, my question is rather silly, but um, is burning fat the, other, the only way that the body has to generate heat? So, so whenever we have to maintain our temperature, this is achieved by burning fat. Oh, uh, good question. That's the, pro uh, the dominant way to, to keep warm when you are new a newborn baby. But when you grow up, you put on clothes and you stay in warm like here, you really do not need a brown fat. So there's a generation of brown fat over age. Because I've been wondering why the, the sweets are so slim. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Okay, uh, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if there are some similar phenomena um, in like metabolism in mammals living in the very cold area, either, either in the water or on land. Well, I'm not an expert in ecology, but I know that the squirrels have high, high amount of brown fat and uh, they actually can live under, like they can survive in minus four degrees without, yeah, and their temperature drops dramatically. So they also have brown fat and uh, also butt, like the, the flying butt, they also have butt. <laughs> and if any geographical uh, investigation, if like really sweets have more brown fat, the cold climate induces brown fat. Very good question. Systematically, um, I'm I'm curious about the the people living the uh, the very north, a very high attitude. The quick quick answer is I do not know. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering how long does the cold exposure need to be in order to see one phenotype or the other? Uh, for human, you just need half an hour of cold exposure. Just swim in the, in the cold water and uh, if you do a passage, you can quickly see your brown fat is lighted up. Uh, if you have brown fat, of course. And when you say cold water? like Cold water is like four degrees. Yeah, like the yeah, people, yeah, we have studied that uh, the, the individuals were going to uh, swim in the uh, ice cold water and they come up and do the PET-CT scans, and uh, both of them are quite, quite active. There's one question there, Alice. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. My question is, you mentioned you use uh, PET-CT to uh, kind of image the brown fat tissue. So what kind of PET tracer do you use for the PET CT imaging? I think it's PET, uh, FDG 18. Okay, FDG, okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, no more questions. Well then, Faye, thanks so much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. So our next speaker is Junju Chao, the grand winner prize of 2020. Unfortunately, he's not with us today, but we are gonna have a pre-recorded presentation by him. He did his Bachelor of Science in Peking University and PhD in University of Washington. Currently, he's an assistant professor at Rockefeller University. And during his thesis, he developed and applied high-throughput single-cell genomics tools to map genetic programs underlying cell proliferation and differentiation. Hello everyone, I'm Jin. Uh, I'm a assistant professor at Lab Halo Single Cell Genomics and Population Dynamics from the Rockefeller University. Thank you uh, for giving me this chance to introduce our uh, previous work about tracking development and uh, cellular level. So as we know that we all develop from this tiny single cell, and this tiny single cell continue to divide and differentiate into hundreds of different cell types and they form different tissues organs, and finally, our body. So we are interested to understand how these different cell types are generated in development. So you can imagine to answer this question, we need to comprehensively characterize this different cell state and their dynamics during development. So traditionally, people study this question by, uh, for example, imaging techniques. Uh, in this case, people use some cell type specific protein markers to label these different cell types. But you can imagine here, for one or two different markers, actually it's limited to characterize these hundreds of different cell types in a single experiment. So alternatively, people use another technique called single cell genomics, or most by single cell RNA sequencing techniques, to characterize these different cells, not based on one or two markers, but based on hundreds to thousands to gene expression. So in this case, we can comprehensively calculate different cell states with light bars, but there's also some limitations for single cell genomics, and the limitation is, is the throughput. For example, here we look at the cell number in the neural system from different organisms, 
Here we have hundreds to millions, even billions of cells, right? Like in the in the in the neural system. However, the throughput of the single cell genomics, like when I just started my graduate school in 2015, it's just a couple of thousand cells. So this is very low compared with this millions to single cell like number in real tissues. And this makes it very challenging to uh, characterize some rare cell types or to study cell population changes during development. So when I uh, started my graduate school in uh, Dr. Jason Jones lab in University of Washington, my main aim is to develop a high throughput single cell RNA sequencing technique. And the key is combinatorial indexing. So combinatorial indexing is a strategy that enables single cell detection without isolating single cells. And here is a trick. For example, here we start with a group of cells. First, we can split the cells into a multiple well plate. And for each well pump, we have like several thousand cells. And we can barcode the molecules in each cell with some well specific barcode. Right? And then we can pull the cell together. So each cell gets one barcode, but some cells actually share the similar barcode because it came from the same well. So the trick here is that we are going to repeat this whole process. So you can imagine after several rounds of random distribution, indexing, and pooling process, the molecules in each cell will be uh, labeled with a, with a specific array of barcode. And because all the molecules from the same cell, they travel through the same set of wells right in each round, which means that the molecule from the same cell they will receive the same barcode array. So which means that if we license all the cells, extract all the molecules for sequencing, we can group molecules from the same cell based on this barcode array. In this case, we can identify single cell information without isolating single cells. So the key feature from this technique, you can imagine like, like the throughput of the, the technique depends on the barcode like complexity or the diversity right, that can be generated in this experiment, which means that the detection capacity of how many cells we can profile in a single experiment depends on how many rounds of indexing we do. For example, with just the two round indexing, here we can profile around 40,000 cells. And based on this, I develop a series of single cell genomic techniques to profile single cell transcriptome, single cell both transcriptome and epigenome, or transcriptome and newly synthesized RNA from the same cell. And if we just do include another round indexing with three round indexing, here we can profile like many cells in a single experiment, and we can use this to study the cell population dynamics in early development from both mouse and human. So here I just want to give you one example about how we use these techniques to study cell population dynamics in early development. So for example, here, if you look at the mouse embryos, like across the key stages of the organogenesis, from the 9.5 day to 13.5 day, they have like hundreds of thousands to millions of cells in each individual. And this makes it very challenging for conventional techniques to study the cell population changes at the whole organism scale. So using this uh, commentary connecting strategy, here we develop the sky and sick and use this to profile two million cells from this uh, system across different development stages. And we can use unsupervised machine learning to group cells to different clusters based on their transcriptome similarity. So for example, by the cluster analysis, we can identify main cell types from uh, mouse embryos that includes uh, connect tissue predangers to some very rare cell types, for example, the lens, the monocyte, and the other cells. So this represents the main cell state in mouse embryonic development. So the question is that for these different cell types, how the dynamic change or how they are generated in early development, right, like from early to late one more stages. So to track the cell state changes in this development time window, here we use another algorithm called UMAP that can project the related cell type into a developmental trajectory. For example, this is the cell colored by the main cell types as shown in the previous plot. And by UMAP analysis, we can see the cells like from the related cell lineage are grouped together. For example, this group of cells are all mycetamal cells 
that include chondrocyte, myocyte, and, and other like uh, for example, fire blood cells. And uh, if we uh, like see this group of cells, this group of cells uh, includes uh, the neurons from the CNS uh, system, includes the early progenitors and the differentiation neurons. So after this transformation, we can see the main cell types are grouped into 10 major trajectories from mesenchymal trajectory to epithelial trajectory to different neuroquest trajectory to endothelial trajectory. So because each trajectory here still contain like hundreds of thousand cells. For example, the epithelial cell trajectory is a small cluster here. But if you zoom into this trajectory, for example, here we took out the epithelial trajectory and we do the same analysis. Now we can see the epithelial cells can group into more complex 3D structures. And here the cells are colored by the main epithelial cell type based on their transcriptome signatures. And we can also color the cells by the developmental stage each cell comes from. So combining both information, we can use this to annotate the uh, differentiation trajectory that forms the epithelial cells in different organs. For example, for the mega pinka trajectory, the foriga trajectory, which already separated into two directions, one to the stomach, one to the lung. We can also identify the epithelial cell trajectory that from different sensory organs, the kidney, and others. For example, here, if we look at this trajectory, the epipel external rich cell trajectory is a cell trajectory that uh, involves in our digit form formation. So if we took out this trajectory, we do the thermal analysis, we can directly characterize the cell transition from early development stage to the late development stage. And we can also characterize hundreds of genes that are differentially uh, activated or suppressed like during the cell differentiation process. For example, here, if you look at uh, the down-regulated genes, we can identify some genes involved in, for example, proliferation regulation, uh, like down-regulated in this cell type. And this is also consistent with the fact that this cell type is a transit cell type in development. So this is just one example to show you that we can use this data to study gene dynamics and use this to study how the uh, cell differentiate from early to late development stage. And this is just for a very small cell trajectory, right? So we use a similar strategy to profile, like to analyze other main cell trajectories. And in total, we can identify 56 uh, cell trajectories that uh, corresponds to the cell deficient paths in different organs and systems. Because this is single cell RNA data, so we can also use this to study the gene dynamics or transcription factor dynamics to understand how the different cell types are developed, are developed in, in this critical time window. So in summary here, I show you uh, by this high throughput single cell genomics, we can use this to characterize the cell population from this entire organism, and also use this to understand how the different cell types are generated in early organism genesis. And we also use this technique to profile the cell population dynamics in the later stage, for example, in the fetal, uh, in the different human fetal organs. So because time is limited, so here I just want to show you one result. So from the mouse embryo, uh, embryonic development, we identify 56 embryonic cell trajectories. And from the human, we identify 77 fetal cell trajectories. If we integrate these two data sets together, for example, in this plot, each dot represents a cell from mouse embryos of human, and they are colored by the development stage. For example, here we can directly see the cell transition from the very early embryonic stage, like the 9.5 day. They transit, uh, transit to some later stage, like 10.5 day to 13.5 day, and then, then this moves transit to the human fatal stage. So suggesting that using this data, we can use this to study the cell differentiation path, not in organogenesis stage, but also use this to infer the cell differentiation path from the early embryonic stage to the fatal stage. So at last, I want to thank the great support from my PhD mentor, Dr. Jay Shindior, and also the help from all our collaborators. Also, we are a new lab at the Rockefeller University. I want to thank the support from our current lab members. Also, I want to thank the uh, Science and the Skylife uh, Lab uh, Committee like for recognizing our work and hope everyone can have a great time in the ceremony. Thank you.
I'd like to thank Junyu for this fantastic talk. Uh, we are not going to have questions for him, uh, but I really hope that we are going to have him in another occasion in Stockholm or in Uppsala. Uh, so our next speaker is, uh, again, in the field of genomics, proteomics, and systems biology, Adrian Baez Ortega, the winner of 2021. He's from Spain. He did his Bachelor of Science in University of La Laguna in Spain and Master of Science as well. PhD in University of Washington and currently is in the Welcome Sanger Institute and a junior fellow at the Maudlin College in Cambridge. He worked on the processes that shape the somatic evolution of human and animal tissues in health and disease. Very important thing, this is a very good one. Uh, he actually wrote a novel when he was at high school. And this novel became a bestseller in Spain. <laughs> I'm kidding, only a few copies got sold. He made, uh, he made 14 euros out of it. It's a great pleasure to have you at then. Uh, um, thank you, Ardinch, for that very uh, generous introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, the people at Science and SciLife Lab for giving me the honor of uh, being able to present my PhD research. Um, so this is research I did not, not in Washington, but in, in Cambridge, in the lab of uh, Elizabeth Murchison. And what you're about to see is very much due to her and to the other people in the group to whom any complaint should be directed, <laughs> if you would be so kind. Um, so my PhD is about the evolution of a transmissible cancer in dogs. Transmissible cancers are a unique type of cancer which uh, breaks the very notion of what cancer is. So we think of tumors as um, masses of misbehaving, proliferating cells which are part of our own body. So, so cancer comes from a betrayal, a betrayal and the selfishness of our own selves. And even though they are very life-threatening, the only good thing about tumors is that they are confined within the body of the host, where they arise. So because the cells cannot escape the host, we may say that cancers are doomed to, to extinction every time they arise. So the cancer cannot survive outside the host. But transmissible cancers are the exception to this rule. So these are cancers which have managed to escape their host. So they have survived the death of the original organism by physically transferring their cells to other organisms, to other hosts. Um, this means that the cancer, so, so these cells, these somatic cells are not just cancer cells, but they are also infectious agents. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the oldest um, the most remarkable of these transmissible cancer lineages, which we call the canine transmissible venereal tumor, or CTVT. And we know that this cancer has been spreading between dogs for a long time. The earliest mention we find of it is in this book from 1810, from a London veterinarian called Delabir Blaine, where he describes this happening in free roaming dogs in London. But it wasn't known that this cancer was clonally transmissible between dogs until the very late 19th century. But in fact, we know that this cancer is much older than that. So we know the cancer arose in a husky-like dog, which we call the founder dog. And this dog lived um, probably in the late Neolithic, several thousand years ago. And this was the dog whose cells gave rise to the first CTVT tumor. And those cells developed the ability to exit that founder dog and spread to unrelated dogs in the population, giving rise to a chain of cancer cell transmission which has continued without interruption to the present day. Um, in the case of CTVT, that, um, the physical transfer of cells happens during mating um, because it's a venereal tumor. And so the cells from this, from this ancient dog have become parasites of thousands of other dogs around the world, making CTVT not just the oldest, but also the, the greatest and the most successful cancer clone on the planet that we know of. And it's one of the few cancers that have a shot at actually becoming immortal. And so in my PhD, 
we aim to shed some light on the history and the evolution of this unique cancer. And we wanted to know how it became a global disease and which forces molded its evolution over time and whether its evolution in the long term is representative to what we see in humans over the short term or if it's different. And in order to do that, um, we had to dive into the cancer's DNA. So I had access to a quite extensive collection of tumors which were provided by vets working in 43 different countries. And I was very lucky to have access to this, to this collection, which was, was mainly managed and curated by my colleague Andrea Strakova in Liz Murchison's lab. And what we did basically was to sequence the DNA of all these tumors and look for somatic mutations which have happened since the very first tumor cell. So briefly how we do this is we compare the DNA sequence of each tumor with the reference canine DNA sequence and we look for differences. And mostly we focus on changes of one nucleotide, which we call single nucleotide variants, like this cytosine to thymine change over here. Um, by categorizing this in every tumor, we got an estimate that a typical CTVT tumor has about 38,000 of these mutations only in the exome. And that makes about 2 million somatic mutations genome-wide. And to give you an idea, this is about the average genetic divergence between two unrelated dogs. So these, these cells are so different. They are as different from the original founder dog as two unrelated dogs might be today. Um, but we, we can also put this in the context of cancer. So how many mutations is this for a cancer? So if we look at different types of human cancer, we see this is data from a study in 2013. And we can see that the burden of somatic mutations per genome depends on the tumor type. So we have a range of burdens that goes across three orders of magnitude. And the most mutated cancers are those that are, have, are caused by sustained exposure to mutagens like UV light or, or cigarette smoke. And if we put CTBT in this graph, it's up here. So it has a burden which is superior to any human cancer. But it's not because it mutates very fast or is subject to strong mutagens. But it's because it has had an enormous time to acquire mutations. So actually the rate at which it mutates is rather slow. And the other interesting fact is how in opposition to human cancers, all the CTVT tumors have roughly the same number of mutations because they all have a shared history. So every tumor, every CTVT tumor on every dog on the on on every infected dog on the planet is related to the other tumor, so they form a family. Um, this is the so, so the fact that the, the tumors share their mutations, and these mutations date all the way back to the very first dog. It allows us to use the mutations to trace the history of the cancer. And the first thing we can do is to trace what we call the phylogeography, which is the history of how the lineage diversified, and at the same time how it spread across the world. And the problem here is that we have a set of tumors from the present day, and using the information in these tumors, we need to infer back in time and reconstruct the lineage. And this is the main problem of phylogenetics. So what we do is we use the mutations in these tumors and the patterns of sharing to infer the structure of the lineage back in time. And this is basically what we did in, in, in very few words. And what I found was very interesting. So we were able to refine the date of origin of the tumor, which was previously estimated at around 10,000 years ago. And we saw that the founder tumor most likely, or the founder dog most likely lived between 4,000 and 8,500 years ago, which is a huge error bar. But it's, uh, the, the, the further you go into the past, the wider the error bar gets. And we believe this tumor lives somewhere in Central or Northern Asia because it's very related to the modern Arctic breeds. Um, so then there is a remarkable feature of this lineage tree, which is it has a very long trunk, which takes thousands of years to split into branches. And this reflects the fact that the first tumors were probably confined to an isolated dog population. So it took them thousands of years to spread out of Asia. And at this point, about 2000 years ago, the lineage splits into two. 
there is a very small branch that remains in Asia and never went out. And then there is the main branch that went out of Asia and it arrived in Eastern Europe around a thousand years ago, probably via the Silk Route, the Silk Road. And then the following, the next breakthrough came 500 years ago, which uh, when some bold Europeans took some infected dogs to the Americas. And this seed is an American branch of the lineage. So tumors from these single introduction events 500 years ago have given rise to a large number of cases in North America and South America today. And so there is an American branch of the tree. And then within the last 300 years, an even more remarkable expansion happened when some of the tumors from this American sub-lineage took advantage of the very extensive maritime trade networks established by the European nations. And they used these trading networks to spread out of America into the rest of the world. Um, so this, this was a very rapid expansion, where in the tree, if you look at the black section of the tree, you can barely tell when the branches split. So it was, it was, a, it was a matter of probably a few decades. Um, at the same time, we have a second spread out of Europe that brings new, new cases to places like Australia, Samoa, and, and Lesotho in Africa. So this gives you an idea of how a family of rogue dog cells managed to become a global disease thanks to our um, unhealthy obsession with taking our dogs around when we move across the world. Um, and we think the spread of the, spread of the disease is less uh, accelerated than in the past, although we cannot say for sure. And this is probably because of increased restrictions of the, on the movement of animals across countries. Um, but it's not just about the history, the geographical history of the cancer we can learn about, but the mutations have very valuable information about the processes that have been operating on the genome and how these processes have evolved. So as I said, we look mostly at single nucleotide changes and we characterize them by the base change. So this case is cytosine to thymine, but we can also go one step further and, and subdivide these mutation types according to the trinucleotide context. So the base immediately after and the base immediately before. So in this case, we have a change of C to T at TCC. And this gives a range of 96 types of mutations, which we normally in cancer arrange into this spectrum. So if we take the spectrum of somatic mutations in any individual CTBT tumor, what we find is something like this. So you can see the mutation spectrum is far from uniform. So most of the mutations are cytosine to thymine, and they are concentrated at particular sequence context. And this tells us what processes have been responsible for causing, for causing the mutations and to which extent they have operated relatively. So in order to explore how this varies across space and across time, I subdivided the tree into a number of groups, which you can see with tiny labels on the right. And, and I took the spectra of mutations in each of these, on each of these groups. And by analyzing the variation in these mutation patterns, I was able to decompose them into their basic components, which are called mutational signatures. And each of those signatures tells us which process was responsible for some of the mutations. So apart from some endogenous processes which are known to cause mutations in all mammalian cells, so they were expected, I found two main environmental mutagens operating on the lineage. The first one is ultraviolet light, which um, causes mutations in cells, and, and, and these tumors are often exposed to the outside. So, so we have UV light being the major mutagenic influence on tumors today. And, and moreover, I could measure the, the intensity of this exposure in the different groups, and I could prove that this variation was not random, but it was strongly correlated with latitude. So it's, it's possibly the first quantitative data that of how much UV damage increases as you move towards the equator. And then there was something even more remarkable, which was a very cryptic process that we have never seen before, which caused a very large number of mutations 
in, in Citivity up to a thousand years ago and then vanished. And this is about the time where the tumors left Asia for the first time. Um, so we think, we, we don't really know what this process is because we have never seen anything similar in any other cancer. But we think it could be an environmental exposure which was unique to the original environment where CTVT lived for the first few thousand years. So we're still waiting for clues as to the identity of this mutagen. And then finally, I'd like to tell you something about um, the action of natural selection in the evolution of CTVT and what this might tell us about the future of this and other transmissible cancers. So if we extrapolate from what we know of human cancers, we expect that the evolution of CTVT has been dictated by a succession of acquired so-called driver mutations, which provide ever greater fitness to the cancer cell. And this is how human cancers evolve. And indeed, when I looked at the most, uh, at the earliest somatic mutations, which are, which are shared by all the tumors, I found uh, five, of five potential early driver mutations in cancer genes. But the interesting, well, one interesting thing is that these mutations are not remarkable at all. So they are some of the most common events in human cancers. So there is no evidence from the early mutations that this cancer is in any way special. It seems to be an unremarkable cancer that lives in very remarkable circumstances, like many of us. And the second interesting thing is when, when I look at selection for further mutations down the tree, I found very little evidence for natural selection operating for me to select mutations or to select against mutations. So largely it seems that mutation accumulation has proceeded unopposed by selection. So this, this tells us that the evolution of cancer seems to have a short-term regime which is driven by fast acquisition of um, positively selected mutations and then a long-term regime, which is basically dominated by neutral evolutionary processes like genetic drift. Um, and this might be bad news for CTBT because we know that mutation is an eroding force, so it destroys, it, it, um, it degenerates the functionality of the genome. And normally species have very strong selection against deleterious mutations that preserves the genome, so it purifies it. And without such selection, it's really an open question whether CTVT can survive for, for more than thousands of years and whether it can, um, or whether it's doomed to go down a path of uh, progressive genomic decay. And we don't really know the answer to this yet, but uh, we should take into account that even though this is the oldest cancer we know of, and it's remarkably old, um, if we put this in the context of the tree of life, which has unfolded over billions of years, we should really should wonder whether cancers are able to integrate into this tree as bona fide species and endure this very, this, this very ruthless form of evolution over millions or billions of years. Um, even though this is a very interesting question, I'm afraid that it will have to wait for a future Sci Life Lab conference. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Adrian. Question. Thank you very much for a super interesting presentation. Uh, I didn't know that cancers could be transmitted, mm. so that's uh, new to me. Uh, I can't help to ask, uh, when you show this substitution pattern, uh, it looks to me as ancient DNA samples uh, that I uh, worked with some a little bit. So I guess you thought about that, but the samples that you worked on, these tumor samples, um, for how long were they kept? And how do you deal with this typical C to T DNA damage pattern in order to be able to infer that these are really related to the tumor event and not just the damage of the DNA when the sample is kept. Oh, I see. So, um, the, I mean, the, the, the detection of mutations is a very, very long process. So there's a lot of filtering. So uh, the, the answer to the first question is that the tumors were collected between 
I think it was 2000, 2009 and 2017. Um, so they are kept in our lab under uh, at minus 80. And, they're, um, and then they are sequenced in the, in the usual way. And so we have a number of filters. When we call mutations, we have a lot of false positives. So we need to filter the false positives very stringently with filters which are designed for this kind of this kind of cancer in particular. And then we need to, the most important thing is how we differentiate the mutations that happen in these tumors from the mutations that were already in the founder dog when it was born. Because we don't have any sample from the founder dog. So we don't have the normal. So the reason, one reason why we need so many uh, samples is that we also sequence all the dogs these, sam these samples were derived from. So we get a piece of tissue from the dog. And we pull together of all these normal dogs from today, and we have a and we have a sort of a panel of germline substitutions that we, we can filter against. And this is quite uh, I, I think we estimate we can filter pretty much all of the all of the variation that was that was supposed to be found in the founder dog. Um, so it's it's basically a lot of filtering. Any hey, question? Why are I guess there's two related questions. Why are dogs not immune to this? Like, why isn't their immune system just destroy this? And are there particular breeds of dogs that are immune because they have some sort of adaptation against this? Um, I guess that, that's, so the tumor has some strategies to, to disable the immune system locally. So it creates an immunosuppressive environment. Um, but it is very strange because it, the, the immune system is much more effective at detecting self versus non-self than it is at detecting normal cancers. So, so it's, it is like a tissue transplant. And the immune system, the vertebrate immune system, is very good at detecting um, tissue transplants. And so, so, there is, so we know that the cancer has suppressed MHC signaling. So they cannot be recognized by self, non-self mechanisms. And, but then there is a system whereby um, natural killer cells find these this immunosilent cells and destroy them. And so the, um, the tumor deploys an environment where these cells are suppressed. So they cannot really get in there. And it might also be because the tumor is not really inside the dog, but it's, it's just on the mucous membrane. So it doesn't really, normally it doesn't go into the dog. It depends a lot on the immune state of the dog. So you can find metastatic cases, which are very unusual. And they tend to be because the dog is in, not in a very good condition. And then on the other hand, you have, good, you have dogs which are in very good health and they can actually show a spontaneous remission. But that's also not very frequent. Frequently what would happen is the cancer gets uh, treated with increasing um, for about two weeks or three weeks and it, it, it completely goes away. So it is probably the most curable cancer there is. And there are very few cases of resistance. So it seems to be a balance where the, the tumor is able to is not able to take over the host, but it's able to stay there for long enough to be transmitted. So it behaves really like a parasite and it's very easy to cure. And it can easy it can even be grabbed by a vet and just taken away. So it's a very friable tumor. Thanks for your talk. I was just wondering uh, called to mind the Tasmanian devil facial tumor disease as another example. I was wondering if you conducted the same investigations on that tumor, do you think it would find a similar lack of um, adaptation or natural selection on the tumor? Um, no, we did. It's a very interesting, it's, very, it's a very different cancer. So my group also does the FTD in Tasmanian devils, but it's not my project. So it would be, can you see this? So it would be Max Stamnitz was the person whose PhD was about the Tasmanian devil, mainly. Um, so he has a similar paper, but it's, uh, it's very different findings. So the, the Tasmanian devil tumors is about 30 years old. There are two of them which are always independently in the span of three decades. So it tells you there is something in the species that predisposes to this kind of tumor. The, both of them are in the same part of the body. They spread in the same way and they are from the same cell type. So there seems to be a it, it seems to be the species had to be prone to these things. Um, but he didn't find any drivers. So, so the thing is that the Tasmanian devil reference genome is not 
idea. So it's not uh, up until recently it was very low quality. So he they, he couldn't find any events that he could label as this caused the cancer. So it's a very mysterious cancer. It has very few mutations. The spectrum is very clean, so it's purely endogenous processes. Um, it's just a mystery. It's very aggressive, but genomically, it looks more like a, like a very early leukemia or something like that. It's a very quiet genome. We should look at the biophysics. Hmm. Um, well, maybe I have the final question. Mm -hmm. Are you planning to write the sequel of your first book? <laughs> <laughs> I had to do a market uh, survey to see if, uh, if I'm going to get more than 20 euros. I will do it. There we go. <laughs> well, your presentation looks like a novel anyway. So thanks yeah, very exactly. much. Thanks very much for this beautiful <laughs> yeah. presentation. OK, everyone. Now we are going to have a lunch break. And we'll be back here. 45 past 12. And in the lunch room, we have two rooms. If you can, if you feel that one room is crowded.
Hello, everyone. People are still coming in. Let's wait for a few seconds. All right, I don't see any influx anymore. So, hi again, everyone. We are uh, continuing our afternoon session with the cell and molecular biology section. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce William Allen, the winner of 2021 in cell and molecular biology. He's from the US. He did his Bachelor of Science in uh, Brown University, Master of Science in the University of Cambridge in Computational Biology, and then a PhD in Stanford Neuroscience. Currently, he's at uh, Harvard University, and his thesis, in his thesis, he developed tools to study neural networks from molecules to cells with a particular interest in thirst. And interestingly, he didn't, initially, he didn't want to become a scientist. He wanted to become a philosopher, and probably that's why he ended up doing neuroscience. That is probably closest life science field to philosophy. It's a great pleasure to have you, Will. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, and thank you to SciLife Lab and Science for inviting me to this amazing uh, symposium and to the Wallenberg Foundation for supporting this. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, today I'll be talking about my thesis work, uh, mapping the brain from molecules to networks. So this is a combination of developing new approaches to understand how the brain pr produces behavior and then applying those approaches to understand the very specific type of behavior, uh, thirst. So the production of motivation as a function of an animal's need for water. So my PhD was in systems neuroscience, which is the sort of subfield of neuroscience that tries to understand how activity in networks of cells in the brain produces different types of behavior. And I just want to open with this slide because I think it sort of highlights some of the challenges on a technical level and also on a conceptual level in trying to achieve these goals of systems neuroscience. Uh, and the problem really is that the brain operates on a variety of different spatial and temporal scales. Um, so on spatial scales, the individual components of the brain range over eight orders of magnitude from you know, nanometer scale features like the synapses between individual neurons all the way up to sort of large scale connections that might span meters. Similarly, on a, t on a temporal scale, neural activity varies over 15 orders of magnitude, ranging from microsecond patterns of activity, release of synaptic vesicles, things like that, to long-term memories that can last for 100 years. Um, and so this is implemented at a variety of levels in the brain, ranging from individual molecules all the way up to sort of large-scale neural networks and ultimately behavior. And at a variety of levels, there are different types of questions one might want to ask. And so in neuroscience, there's been a big push over the past decade to developing new tools that can understand the brain at, a, at each of these different levels and try and bridge them together to gain a more comprehensive understanding. Um, and so I'll talk sort of about three vignettes from my PhD, th three different projects that approach these, the understanding of the basis of behavior at different levels and develop new techniques where I'll try and explain both the point of the technique at a broad level in how it can be broadly applied in neuroscience, and also how it led to specific discoveries. Um, and a lot of this is in the context of what's called motivated behavior, which is uh, the set of behaviors that try and explain the question of why do animals engage in different actions at different times? So in nature, you look at an animal in the wild or people in a room, and you see that they'll do different things at different times. This is explained by variables in the brain that we call internal states, which cause them to you know, at a certain time, eat food, drink water, uh, parent their children, mate with other animals, fight, for example. Some of these are homeostatically regulated. So for example, eating and drinking are in response to a need for food or a need for water. Others are in response to specific stimuli. For example, fighting, you see another 
you know, animal that is acting aggressive towards you or escape, you see some sort of threat uh, to your environment. And so the general conceptual framework for how these uh, motivated states are implemented in the brain are that there are specific needs, and in particular, this is true for homeostatic uh, motivated behaviors, where there's some uh, physiological deprivation that the animal is experiencing. These are sensed by what are called interoceptors, which are specialized sets of cells in the brain that detect the in internal environment uh, in the body, the physiological state of the body, and try and sense some deviation from a set point in a particular physiological variable. Um, as I'll explain for thirst, for example, this could be the blood pressure or the osmolarity of the blood. Uh, for hunger, it could be some sort of signal related to the metabolic status or the need for food. These interoceptors, which you can imagine as like, for example, the, the retina of the body. So there, there are particular sets of neurons that look inside the body detect specific things, and then send signal to the rest of the brain that particular behaviors need to be engaged in in order to obtain whatever is needed as a function of the deviation from some physiological set point. Um, and it's been found over many, many years of study that there are distinct populations of neurons in different parts of the brain that seem like they control specific motivated behaviors. So you can find part, either specific neurons depending on the level of analysis or even just specific parts of the brain that control, for example, drinking, feeding, sex, aggression, fear, and thermoregulation. So this is all evolutionarily hardwired because these are all behaviors that are necessary for survival and reproduction. And so when I began my PhD, I was very interested in using thirst as a model system to study the mechanisms underlying these motivated behaviors in a very precise and defined way. Thirst is very convenient because it's very easy to induce in mice. Uh, you know, you take a mouse, you don't give it a water bottle for a day, and they're basically willing to do almost whatever task you want them to perform. So this is the way we commonly motivate animals in the lab. For example, if you want to study learning and memory, or uh, you know, even just simple types of behaviors where you need them to, like for example, reach for a, a lever to study motor control. Uh, however, at the time I started my PhD, it was very unclear. Uh, at the fine scale, what the specific cells were in the brain that were controlling thirst, uh, how the activity of these cells produced the, the behaviors where animals would go out and seek water or cause them to do some other behavior in order to get water, uh, what the motivational mechanisms underlying this control behavior was, and then sort of what the transmission from those cells that might sp be specific for sensing the particular need for water to some other arbitrary behavior that allows them to eventually get that water. Um, and the problem was that the neurons that were thought to control these or sen sense the need for water and control these behaviors were in a specific part of the brain that was generally known to control this type of motivated behavior, but it was very heterogeneous. So there were different neurons in this one part of the brain that controlled, seemed like they controlled thirst, thermoregulation, parenting behavior, many different things, and they were all intermingled together. And there was no clear way of genetically or otherwise experimentally accessing the specific set of cells that would control thirst and not some other behavior. Um, and so we knew generally what the part of the brain was. We knew that there were certain populations in other parts of the brain uh, that probably sensed these things, but it seemed like there was this convergence point at this one particular brain region called the median preoptic nucleus, or MMPO, where different signals related to the physiological state of the body were integrated, and that's where the sensation of thirst was really produced. Um, and so in order to access this set of neurons within this very cellularly heter heterogeneous part of the brain, we developed a new tool, which we called TRAP, or TRAP2, because it was actually the second version of the TRAP. The original version didn't work very well. Um, that allows you to permanently genetically label subsets of neurons that are active within some time window. So when neurons fire action potentials, they turn on a subset of genes called immediate or early genes or actively regulated genes. In particular, one has been very extensively studied called FOSS. So FOSS is a gene that's induced when neurons are above a particular level of activity, and you can make a transgenic mouse that then turns the expression of this gene into permanent genetic expression of some other transgenic construct. And the way you do this is you create an in-frame fusion of FOSS with this Cre-ER protein that normally sits in the cytoplasm, but then when in the presence of the drug tamoxifen will translocate into the nucleus and cause recombination in some other gene, which then is permanently expressed. So this allows you to mark cells in a permanent way uh, basically with the logical and between expression of the FOSS gene and the presence of the drug tamoxifen, which you can inject systemically. And so as a first experiment, what we did was uh, label the specific set of cells 
in this medium preoptic nucleus uh, in mice that were deprived of water. As you can see um, sorry. on the right, in control mice that are just normally have their, their water in their cage, you inject this drug and you don't really see anything. You see a few random scattered cells. But then when you take away water just for 24 hours or 48 hours, suddenly you see this very specific population of cells in this one particular part of the brain light up and essentially nowhere else in the brain. So these are the cells that are probably responsible for thirst. And then we could study them in a variety of ways that I don't really have time to go into. But at a high level, what we can do is use some of the optogenic tools that were previously mentioned where using light, we can turn on or off specific subsets of neurons to activate or inactivate these neurons show that when they're inactivated, mice will not consume water even though they should naturally be thirsty. When you activate them in a mouse that normally has full access to water, they'll go and seek out and consume water or even learn some arbitrary behavior in order to consume water. Um, it's intrinsically motivating, so they find the activation of these neurons aversive. They'll avoid the side of the box where these neurons are stimulated. And in fact, you can use the reduction of activity of these neurons to train a mouse to press a lever. So if you continuously stimulate these neurons and then whenever they press a lever, reduce the stimulation of those cells, they'll actually learn to do that task. And then finally, we showed that uh, the natural activity of these cells tracks their water consumption in real time. So as animals uh, are, as they're water deprived, the activity of these cells is at some level, and then as they gradually consume water, the activity of these neurons changes and then at a certain point it stops changing and that's when they stop engaging at thirst motivated behavior. So the idea is that these cells directly encode the motivational state of the animal. As they consume water, the activity of these cells is modulated in real time and there's sort of a feedback loop where the aversive signal of these cells over time reduces and that reduces their desire to perform some behavior in order to get water. So this is what's called a drive reduction mechanism uh, for how this neural circuit controls thirst motivated behavior. Okay, so then the question was, this is one small, very hardwired part of the brain that is very specifically responsible for thirst or for water deprivation. How is it the case that actually these neurons in one part of the brain can control neurons in the rest of the brain to allow it to actually, you know, sense some stimulus in the environment to see that there's water there, to respond to some cue, to engage in some motor action that allows it to go and actually consume the water or find it and then consume it. And so we knew that this subset of neurons actually projects very broadly in the brain. So this, these neurons are in one part of the brain called the hypothalamus or the medium preoptic nucleus, but they send their axons out very broadly to many different parts of the brain that are known to be involved in sensation, in action, in you know, other types of motivated behavior, things like that. It was very unclear actually uh, if there was sort of a specific node where these neurons were intervening in their regulation of behavior, since it seemed like they were kind of being broadcast very broadly. Um, and so we needed to develop a new tool to be able to study these distributed neural networks throughout the brain instead of focusing in on a particular circuit, like for example the thirst neurons, to actually look at activity throughout the entire brain as an animal is engaging in behavior and understand how these motivated behaviors are implemented as brain states and not as the activity in specific populations of cells. And so fortunately around the time I started this project there was a new technology that was developed over many years by a consortium that sort of brought uh, electrophysiology into the 21st century. So since the 1960s, people have used what's called extracellular electrophysiology to record the activity of single neurons in awake behaving animals with very high uh, temporal resolution. So you can stick a very fine electrode into a brain, it'll sit next to a single neuron and you can record the action potentials of that neuron as an animal is you know, doing some behavior or sensing some stimulus. And there was a project that was launched maybe five or six years ago, or longer now, that uh, use modern microelectronics tools to build basically parallel versions of these uh, extracellular recording arrays. So this is a single piece of silicon that has hundreds of recording sites on it in the tiny, basically, needle that you can stick into the brain. And this, for the first time, allows you to record simultaneously from several hundred neurons with single cell and single spike resolution at, with millisecond or microsecond temporal resolution. And so I took these probes, which have recently been developed, and developed an approach where we could really perform sort of systematic mapping of activity throughout a large part of the brain. And the way we did this was we would, I would record from different animals performing the same behavior at different times. And for every time I inserted the electrode, I coded it with a die. 
where after the fact, after the, we had done the behavior and recorded all the activity, I could kill the mouse uh, and then image its brain in 3D on the light sheet microscope and reconstruct where the electrode had been inserted. And then you can register all the brains together computationally and in 3D basically figure out where every single neuron that you recorded from was likely to be in a three-dimensional volume. And in this way, build up a spatiotemporal map of activity averaged across many animals over its entire brain. And so in this case, as I'll say, in a, using a thirst-motivated behavior, I recorded 24,000 neuron, individual neurons across 34 brain areas uh, in 21 mice, which was at the time, or maybe still is, the largest single electrophysiological recording that's ever been done. Um, so usually these experiments uh, record maybe like a few hundred neurons, and that takes months of work. This is orders of magnitude larger and in a single, basically in a single experiment. Um, and so I applied this technique to understand thirst mode behavior in a slightly different way where now I have a mouse that's head restrained so he can insert the electrode into different parts of its brain and it's performing a task where it's consuming water gradually over time. As it drinks more and more water, it's, they're water deprived at the beginning, they consume water over time, they gradually become sated and stop performing a task. And so the question is basically what's happening in their brain both when they're thirsty and they're willing to do this you know, arbitrary tasks where they smell a smell and lick for water, and then what's changing in their brain over time as they're consuming water and eventually stopping to respond to the same cue. Um, and so I think the first thing that was really surprising when we recorded in this behavior was that there was essentially neural activity everywhere I looked. So every t everywhere, anywhere I put in the electrode, you could find cells that were modulated by this behavior. And in fact, almost 50% of the cells that I recorded throughout the brain uh, were task modulated in some way. So they just if you put an electrode anywhere, there were cells that were active uh, in this behavior. And there was specificity. So there were some sets of cells in different parts of the brain, depending on where you're recording from. If it was a sensory area that were more selective for the sensory cue itself, in the motor areas more selective for the motor response. But really, there was like a huge spectrum in between. Um, and so it really seemed like the production of this behavior was much more of a brain-wide uh, state or a, a product of brain-wide activity than anyone would have previously thought, and that was very surprising. And the other surprising thing was that, moreover, so you might expect, okay, the mouse is doing some complicated behavior, there's lots of parts of the brain that are involved, maybe that's, you know, whatever, that's what you might expect. Um, even more surprising was the fact that also anywhere, essentially anywhere we recorded, we could find individual cells whose resting activity, so not correlated with the behavior, uh, track the satiety state of the animal. So as the animal would get thirstier and thirstier, this just sort of spontaneous firing rate of these cells would vary over time and would encode whether the animal is willing to perform the task or not. So there's a distributed brain-wide representation of the animal's motivational state, not just in these neurons that are selective for, or, or very specific for encoding thirst motivation, but actually everywhere in the brain. Um, and we were able to show that essentially this uh, state was causal. So we could reactivate the thirst neurons and reintroduce the state, turn on the behavior again, and then reintroduce the state. And exactly the same neurons that would naturally have activity while the animal is thirsty and performing the behavior, or that seem to encode the thirst motivation themselves, would be returned on when we artificially stimulated these neurons. So it seemed like it really is sort of a causal mechanism where this specific set of neurons is broadcasting this information throughout the brain, and that's broadly modulating many neural circuits to produce this brain-wide activity state that implements this particular behavior. And I think that normally in neuroscience, people study individual parts of the brain as sort of separate units that they think are implementing some specific behavior or some other behavior, but this shows that actually uh, probably the production of behavior is much more of a global phenomenon that we pre than we previously thought. I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just very briefly mentioned this last paper, which you can go look up if you're interested. Um, but another major question is trying to identify the cell types in the brain. So the, there are hundreds of cell types in the brain. We want to map them through, for example, single cell genomics, as Jun Kao mentioned, but also their spatial location. And we developed a technique that allows us to uh, measure the expression of up to 1,000 genes simultaneously in an intact piece of tissue um, and relate it to uh, neural activity and to other cellular features. Okay, so just in conclusion, um, we developed these different tools that allow us to study the brain at multiple levels and use this to both identify these specific 
neural circuits that are very that are responsible for the production of thirst motivation and understand how those neural circuits impact the rest of the brain and produce these brain-wide states that implement the specific thirst motivated behavior. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit over time, but uh, I just wanted to thank all my collaborators uh, and my advisors, Carl Dice Roth and Lee Chun Lo. Thank you very much. Well, very nice questions for Will. Okay, I will start maybe. So, when you say thirst, I think I might have a bit of a problem with the definition of thirst. Yeah. Do you mean metabolically? when the body is dehydrated, it sends signals to the brain and then it fires up yeah. neurons, or the cells generally get dehydrated. That could also be thirst. So right? the, how, do, how would you distinguish between yeah. metabolic signal from all over the body to the brain or just the dehydration of the cells? Um, yeah, in this case, so it's, it's a, there are specific physiological signals that are sensed by a specific subset of neurons that uh, lack a blood-brain barrier, so they have it. They can sample the blood directly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Maybe there are other types of sensors in cells that could sense osmolarity directly. But there's, in this case, there are specific hormones, angiotensin II, and sort of physical signals about related to the blood osmolarity that are being sensed by specific subsets of neurons. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean by thirst. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? No. <laughs> no questions? Okay. There is one yeah. there. So I was also wondering that uh, um, when we talk about thirst, for example, when it's a disease condition, some disease might have like the condition that pe patients feel dry mouth. Would this also kind of impact like the brain behavior, or it's kind of like more uh, that? Uh, your brain feels thirsty and then all the uh, neural cells get motivated and then you have some kind of like behavior in the human behavior level of indications? Um, I'm not sure, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so there are other, there are other signal, like sensory signals that can indicate thirst and that can actually be used to manipulate thirst. So for example, like even just eating a cold, ice cube or something will, to some extent, relieve thirst, even though you're not consuming more water. So yeah, there are other signals that can impinge on it that might be affected by disease states um, that can sort of override some of these circuits that are sensing physiological variables more directly. Possibly a strange question, but is there anything in your studies that uh, relates to the uh, subjective experience of feeling thirsty and how that would, um, yeah, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so the most we could do with that, I sort of briefly mentioned this, is we could show that the activity of these cells was strongly aversive. So, you know, subjectively, we <coughs> don't feel good when we're thirsty. And you can show that operationally in mice by basically stimulating these neurons and showing that mice will avoid the side of a box where these neurons are being stimulated, or that they'll even work to perform a task in order to turn off stimulation of these neurons. So we can't ask the mice what they're feeling, but it seems like the activity of these neurons is aversive, and part of the motivational mechanism is the reduction of this feeling of aversion by turning off the activity of these neurons. Wenfei, you have a question still? Uh, can we yeah. can we wait for the mic because that's important for the online audience? Uh, I'm wondering about the trapped mice because it also labels non-neuron cells, and in your third model, do you find some uh, some cells besides neurons are also activated? And uh, it's pretty specific for neurons for whatever reason. It might be some sort of regulation of the FOS gene, but yeah, in general, there's not really many glia or vascular cells or other things are labeled. Yeah. Okay, for the sake of time, thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Well. So we go to our last winner, uh, Aneta Romanowska, the winner of 2021 in cell and molecular biology. So Anette graduated from University of Latvia 
and did a PhD in Max Perutz's lab in Vienna, where currently uh, she's still working at. And her thesis focused on how lipid properties affect uh, functions of membrane. What an interesting topic, especially in nuclear membranes. Totally uh, uh, objective. So, uh, Annette, it's very nice to see you here. We have another dancer. She's also a uh, big, uh, she's fond of dancing and also teaching dancing. Mostly urban. Not teaching, I just mean the courses. Oh, the okay. <laughs> okay. Well, now you have to teach class. Okay. <laughs> Very good to have you here. Thank you for the kind introduction. And I'm really grateful to be here. And I'm also really, really uh, honored to receive this award and have this recognition um, for my work. And when I first um, saw this uh, image, and these dots, I actually thought that that's exactly what I see under the microscope. So you will see it also later. So, and today I will share with you a small part of my PhD project, which is seeing fat inside the nucleus. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER in short, is the biggest membrane system in our cells. And it has uh, several different compartments. And one of the compartments is the inner nuclear membrane. And it's the membrane I'm interested in. And uh, if we take a closer look, uh, then the nuclear envelope that encloses our genome consists of two membranes, the inner nuclear membrane and the outer nuclear membrane. And these membranes are fused together at sites where the nuclear pore complexes are embedded. The outer nuclear membrane is uh, continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum, which is the main site of lipid synthesis. And since lipids can diffuse within the membranes, it is generally assumed that the lipid composition of the inner nuclear membrane is similar to the outer nuclear membrane and the endoplasmic reticulum. Moreover, um, people have observed that lipid droplets, which are organelles for energy storage, are made from the endoplasmic reticulum and from the outer nuclear membrane, but not from the inner nuclear membrane. And therefore, it is thought that the inner nuclear membrane is metabolically silent. And in my PhD work, I wanted to challenge these assumptions. Of course, people have already thought about this question decades ago, and they wanted to understand which are the lipids at the inner nuclear membrane, and where do they come from? The problem is that uh, by a chemical approach, it does not really work because uh, these membranes, the inner and outer nuclear membrane, are only 10 to 15 nanometers apart, so it's really hard to separate and get a few fractions of them. To overcome this problem, our idea was to use lipid biosensors in, li in living cells. But before we go further, we have to look how lipids are synthesized in yeast. And this pathway is uh, conserved between yeast and humans. And uh, first, the nutrients, as glucose and fatty acids, are converted into phosphatidic acid. Phosphatidic acid is really a key lipid species because it lies in this decision point whether to channel lipids for, uh, into phospholipid, into ch to channel phosphatidic acid into uh, phospholipids for membrane growth, or either use uh, phosphatidic acid and convert it to diacylglycerol and then triacylglycerol, which is, the, which is the final lipid which is stored in lipid droplets. And since uh, phosphatidic acid is the, one of the most important lipid species, we designed a lipid biosensor for it. So our idea was to take a domain that specifically recognizes uh, phosphatidic acid and attach a fluorophore to it, in this case, M. cherry, so that we would be able to see it in cells. And in this way, we would be able to test all the membranes in the cytoplasm. And then the attachment of nuclear localization sequence would drive the sensor inside the nucleus and therefore would allow us also to test the inner nuclear membrane. So we searched the literature and we found that um, Yeast uh, protein, OP1, has a specific domain called Q2, which binds phosphatidic acid. So we express this domain in yeast cells. So here you see um, yeast cells. So this with the white uh, dashed line is marked uh, the yeast. So that's how yeast looks under the microscope. And what we observed is that our sensor binds the plasma membrane, indicating uh, high levels of phosphatidic acid at the plasma membrane. So then we attach the nuclear localization sequence to see what is the situation at the inner nuclear membrane. And what you can see that 
Our sensor is indeed inside the nucleus because we have a marker for the nucleus, which is NAF188. But the sensor is nucleoplasmic, and that indicates that uh, there's low levels of phosphatidic acid at the inner nuclear membrane. And uh, having the sensor, we ne next ask whether the inner nuclear membrane responds to change lipid environment. And to do that, uh, our idea was to inhibit um, CDS1 with a temperature sensitive uh, mutant, and we expected that this inhibition of CDS1 would increase levels of phosphatidic acid, diacylglycerol, and then uh, then triacylglycerol, which is stored in lipid droplets, and therefore we would increase uh, lipid storage. And as I mentioned to you at the beginning, uh, lipid droplets are organelles for energy storage. They mostly consist of triacylglycerol, which is then covered by a phospholipid monolayer. So we use CDS1, the temperature-sensitive cells, and a wild-type cells um, as a control. We expressed our uh, um, NLS sensor with m cherry, and we stain lipid droplets with a dye called body pee. Uh, first, you see uh, here examples uh, of cells when they are grown at 23 degrees. 23 degrees is a permissive temperature for CDS1, and you see in both conditions that we have sensor that is nucleoplasmic and small lipid droplets. Next, we switch cells to 30 de uh, 37 degrees, which is a restrictive temperature for CDS1. And what we observed is that in case of wild type, we see the same situation as at 23 degrees. But in case of CDS1, we see increase of body P signal, which was what we expected because we expected increase of lipid droplets. But surprisingly, we also saw that our sensor uh, encircles um, these lipid droplets, and therefore, we term these uh, structures nuclear lipid droplets. And to see how these structures evolve over time, we did a time course. So in time course in the CDS1 cells, so 37 degrees. And you see that after one hour, the sensor is nucleoplasmic. And after two hours, we have this increase um, of the sensor at the inner nuclear membrane, indicating that there's increase of phosphatidic acid. After three hours, we see some small foci, and after four hours, we have uh, major nuclear lipid droplets, which has observed all the sensor on the surface. And to ensure that these structures are indeed inside the nucleus, we did electron uh, microscopy, and here you see uh, the nucleus of the CDS1 cell, and you see that the lipid droplet is inside the nucleus. So we have found that cells make new organelles inside the nucleus, organelles that store fat. But we wanted to also verify that this is not just the um, mutant condition, that also wild-type cells would be able to do that. And uh, therefore, we supplemented cells with high-fat diet, meaning a medium that uh, contains a lot of fatty acids. And indeed, what we observed that approximately 10% of cells uh, were able to make nuclear lipid droplets. But in many cells, we also observed this increase of phosphatidic acid at the inner nuclear membrane which resembles CDS1 inhibition after two hours. So we could show that also wild-type cells have an ability to make nuclear lipid droplets. Uh, next, we uh, wanted to see how CDS1 is regulated. And it is regulated in yeast by OP1, you know, 2, you know, 4 complex. So our hypothesis was that uh, if we delete, you know, 2 or, you know, 4, because these are activators, we would see the same response as CDS1 inhibition. And why we wanted to use these deletions? Because it's easier to work with deletions than with the temperature shift. And uh, indeed, we could observe the same uh, situation as in CDS1 uh, inhibition, that we saw these uh, lipid droplets that are covered by our sensor. And again, to verify that these are indeed nuclear lipid droplets, we did electron uh, microscopy. And here you see several examples of uh, nucleus of, uh, you know, for delta cells that uh, contain nuclear lipid droplets. To understand in details how these nuclear droplets are related to the inner nuclear membrane, we did the uh, electron tomography. So here we are going through these stocks of, uh, you know, for delta cell nucleus. You see the inner nuclear membrane and outer nuclear membrane. Outer nuclear membrane is covered by ribosomes, marked here with the red circles. 
And uh, we have here one uh, big lipid droplet. We have here one lipid droplet in this uh, perinuclear space, and here one lipid, uh, one apparently free-floating small nuclear lipid droplet. So we were interested, especially how this uh, nuclear lipid droplet is um, connected to, uh, to the inner nuclear membrane. And it was interesting for us that it's not just a stalk that connects uh, the nuclear lipid droplet to the inner nuclear membrane, it's, it is an extended connection, like a membrane bridge that connects it uh, to the inner nuclear membrane. And we think that this might be also a way how lipids and proteins could travel from the inner nuclear membrane towards the nuclear lipid droplet, and of course also the other way back. Another interesting region, which we often found in these ENO4 delta cells that make uh, nuclear lipid droplets, is this altered uh, perinuclear space. So we see th this nuclear lipid droplet here, but what we also observed was these evaginations. And these evaginations are approximately 70 nanometer in diameter. So one possibility is that these um, evaginations are made when these lipid droplets are formed and maybe also then budding from the inner nuclear membrane. But other possibility might be that they are formed just because they change lipid metabolism. So that is a question in the future to still answer why we have these um, evaginations. But um, our microscopy data clearly shows that these nuclear lipid droplets are formed from the inner nuclear membrane and have connection to the inner nuclear membrane. Um, next, we wanted to understand deeper the mechanism how nuclear lipid droplets are formed and which proteins might be involved in this process, but nothing is known about nuclear lipid droplets. So therefore, we looked at what we know about cytoplasmic lipid droplets. And there are several classes of proteins that are important for cytoplasmic lipid droplets. And the, and the key player for cytoplasmic lipid droplets is safin. And it's a protein which is of, always find, uh, found at the places where, you, uh, where lipid droplets are uh, formed. And it also affects lipid droplet formation, the size and number. And it's thought that it can also trap triacylglycerol. And therefore, we ask whether sapin might be also a player uh, in nuclear lipid droplet uh, formation. But to first uh, um, answer that, we have to answer the question whether sapin is even found at the inner nuclear membrane because it is an ER protein. <laughs> and to answer this question, uh, we use a biomolecular fluorescent complementation assay. So in this assay, you have a split fluorophore. You attach one part of the fluorophore to one protein, another part to the other protein. And if these proteins come in close proximity, you see a signal under the microscope because you reconstruct the fluorophore. So we attach one part of this uh, uh, fluorophore to NAP60, which is a nuclear bar, uh, pore basket protein, that which, is, which is facing nucleoplasm, and the other part we attach to safin. And indeed, when we did the microscopy, we see foci, which indicates that safin um, is found at the inner nuclear membrane. And next we ask whether safin is also found in close proximity to nuclear lipid droplets, and indeed, when we induce formation of nuclear lipid droplets, we could also see uh, foci in close proximity of our nuclear lipid droplets. But to understand whether it might also have some functional significance, uh, we deleted sapin in nuclear lipid droplet producing cells. So here on top, uh, you see a control cell which has many membrane bridges between the nuclear lipid uh, droplet and inner nuclear membrane. But when we deleted sapin, what we observed is that we lose these membrane connections between the inner nuclear membrane and nuclear lipid droplet. And moreover, also these evaginations are often um, irregular or even fused together. So we can say that sapin affects the architecture of nuclear lipid droplet producing cells. And this is really interesting because uh, um, sapin causes the most severe um, uh, lipodystrophy in humans which is characterized by severe loss of body fat, ectopic fat deposition, and overall changed lipid metabolism. And for example, here you see a mouse model of uh, lipodystrophy, and you can see that uh, there's a severe loss of body fat and also ectopic fat deposition of liver, and therefore liver is much bigger. And in the future, therefore, it would be interesting to see whether sapin also plays, whether sapin at the inner nuclear membrane plays a role in human lipodystrophy. And with that, what I, I want to um, summarize what I have shown you today. So I have shown that the inner nuclear membrane 
is metabolically active and can store lipids uh, by making nuclear lipid droplets. Ino2 and Ino4 complex and also nutrients regulate uh, nuclear lipid droplet uh, production. And sapin-dependent membrane bridges connect these nuclear lipid droplets with the inner nuclear membrane. And with that, I hope I convince you today that uh, the inner nuclear membrane is not just a remote uh, territory of the endoplasmic reticulum, but it's a membrane with its own active uh, lipid metabolism. And with that, um, I would like to thank my supervisor, Alvin Kohler. Uh, we, I work alone on this project together with him, and um, I'm really, really grateful for all his support and help. And without him, I probably wouldn't be here, uh, wouldn't be, and this work wouldn't be done. And um, I also want to thank um, Vienna, Vienna Biocenter um, electron microscopy facility, because also without them, this wouldn't be possible. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Anita. So, uh, first question from Enfi. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. I actually had a question that relates to your field but isn't uh, completely uh, uh, to do with nuclear membranes. And this is a question about plasma membranes and the retina. The retinal photoreceptor cell has a very special morphology characterized by an extremely large surface area that's provided by special extensions mm -hmm. of the plasma membrane that actually grow and fold across themselves. And this is important because we need that surface area to house the light sensing machinery. I'm just wondering if you knew of any key genes that might induce plasma membrane formation and or folding in, uh, in the mammalian retina? Sorry, it's a very really specific, specific question. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I just thought I would ask because you were here. <laughs> One fair question. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh. What do you think the physiological function of these droplets are in the nucleus? Yeah, that's a really good question. Of course, we also ask that ourselves. And um, right now, for, uh, for sure, we know one function, and that is that uh, these nuclear lipid droplets can also sequester uh, one transcription factor, which is OP1. So actually, this uh, sensor is coming from OP1, uh, what I also showed in the presentation. And OP1 is the master regulator in the yeast cells for lipid metabolism. So what we found is actually that these lipid droplets can sequester OP1 in the nucleus and therefore also change the transcription programs and then the lipid metabolism. So we think that that might be kind of um, feedback regulation to regulate the lipid synthesis. So when you have too much activity of OP1, it can be sequestered on these uh, nuclear lipid droplets. So that is one, but uh, we think that probably there might be even more. And uh, of course, one, one Possibility is also that these uh, nuclear lipid droplets are just storing also energy as the same as cytoplasmic lipid droplets. But we think that there might be some additional uh, features of nuclear lipid droplets just because they are in different environment than the uh, cytoplasmic ones. And the composition of them, you also have uh, um, not tested yet? We haven't. We want to isolate them, but right now we cannot get them to this amount that would be good for analysis. Mm -hmm. Your question was the same? Uh, yeah, okay. quite naive. Uh, does mammalian cells also have this lipid droplet within the nuclei? Uh, yes, uh, actually, I would say that in last years, there are more and more reports about that. Uh, because previously, people were not sure whether these nuclear lipid droplets are really nuclear lipid droplets because um, human cells have open mitosis. And therefore, you would think that these nuclear lipid droplets might also be um, kind of entrapped, you know, when the nuclear envelope is. Uh, reassembled. And that's actually an advantage for yeast because we have closed mitosis, so what is in is in. <laughs> so that's why people have reported these nuclear lipid droplets already decades ago, but nobody really looked into them. And actually last years, last few years, there are several reports also about that, but uh, the mechanism how they form is a bit different. So for example, uh, there's a lot of nuclear lipid, uh, lipid droplets in uh, hepatocytes, and they are uh, coming from um, uh, very low density lipoproteins. And it's thought that they are going 
through the nuclear membranes just because there are some disruptions in the nuclear envelope and they're going through because they're also in human cells you have these um, uh, nuclear kind of uh, membrane intrusions into the nucleoplasm. So the lipid droplets are going th uh, through and then when there's no lamina, they're kind of going through. But that's not the mechanism uh, in yeast. So it, it differs, but also there's uh, nuclear lipid droplets in human cells. Uh, I'm also wondering, how does a cell use this lipid within the nuclear? How, what, yeah. So like I said, we don't know for sure, but um, if they are connected to the inner nuclear membrane, they can also use these uh, lipids um, then later, because we also found lipases there, so it means that there's active metabolism on these uh, lipid droplets. So if you use lipases, you can then um, get uh, fatty acids, for example, and use them. And maybe they also are involved in uh, lipid signaling because people have also found different uh, lipids uh, inside the nucleus, so they might also serve as a platform for signaling. Actually, we also observe a lot of uh, lipids going into nucleus when we try to label plasma membrane. They always internalize. But recently we started, uh, accidentally, we saw a lot of fluorescent lipids in the nucleus, very specific types of lipids. Some lipids don't end up there. Some lipids really end up there. We always thought this would be this invaginations of nucleus, but uh, we never looked at it carefully. Maybe we, I should show you some <laughs> images as well exactly. later, yeah. All right. Well, we, we are perfectly in time. Thanks so much, Anita. Thank you. It was a fantastic talk. <laughs> so in this section of our symposium, we are going to have a session with the speakers with some free questions. So uh, I will also get some questions from the audience if you're really wondering something about their life, their science, their books that they published. So. Um, I think I will ask the first question so that it will also give you some time to think about. And I'm sure the first question that everyone wonders, we have all the speakers here, yes. What are you going to do with the money you want? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, I'll ask you this question privately later. <laughs> so, first question I'd like to ask. As I said initially, that I really thought this will be the future of science and society. In the scientific world, if you had the power now, what would you change? <coughs> if my question is not clear, I can clarify with other words, but I think I can see the faces, so they're thinking. It <laughs> should be clear. Main problem of science that you actually would change now. Well, I, I think the main problem we have is that we don't know how to evaluate merit. So we use publications as a proxy because they are easy. And, and they have, I think, so they are very f low false negatives. Mm, no, very low false positives, but a lot of false negatives. So we don't really know how to assess excellence other than by publication. And publication depends on a lot of things than, than excellence. Um, but I, I don't think we have come up with a, a proper index for it. Um, I don't know, the, the, the countries that try to implement very comprehensive ways of addressing performance in lots of things, they don't tend to do so well in terms of finding excellence. So I don't think we have come up with a something that is feasible. And that's, I think that's one of the main problems we have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I, I think it's not, uh, science is not being available to most people is, I think is a huge problem and and this new era of um, of, of non-science uh, news is 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 quite overwhelming, and I don't think people really know what to do with it. It's like a post-science world or something, and 
I guess it's mainly because it's so non-available to probably 99% of the people. And I guess it comes back to the to that publications problem that we publish so many papers um, to ourselves <laughs> and it's just an echo chamber. So, I, um, but then, yeah, who, 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 who's supposed to, who's supposed to pay for those publications and, and the journals are just uh, quite rich and everyone else is just doing free, free labor for, the <laughs> for many journals. So it's, I think all of these things are quite problematic. Um, and also that science is quite biased, I think, um, yeah, to, to human, it's a bit too human centered, but obviously that's, <laughs> I'm also biased. <laughs> Thank you, Rossi. Not everyone has to answer, so don't feel pressure. Um, so my background is in medicine, and I would say that uh, it would be good to integrate science and medicine a little bit better. There's a lot of effort being made worldwide to have really fantastic MD-PhD programs, but once this is finished, there is a lack of infrastructure, and people are forced to choose to do one or the other. I think this is uh, an area that we could globally uh, improve on. Okay, no more answers. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, there's one question there. Uh, this is directed to Dasha. Uh, we we're just curious about uh, what kind of vision it is when you use near infrared to induce uh, the visionary senses. So, like as a human. Uh, what do you actually see? Do you see black and white, or uh, what kind of vision? Uh, yeah. From um, the optogenetic experience, which currently includes one or almost two patients, uh, we know that people see uh, in black and white. We don't, at the moment, have the capacity to introduce color vision. And the vision that the person has, it is not the same as natural vision. Um, it does, however, equip patients to detect edges and contours and shapes and larger objects, which is helpful for navigation. This is where we are at now with the visible spectrum. And of course, it will be possible to induce various um, refinements in the future. With near-infrared, it will be probably a little bit similar. We are also wanting to improve navigation and equip patients with the ability to see large objects in black and white. For now, this is the aim. Mm -hmm. More questions? There's one more, yeah. Maybe we can give to Hannes first, because he didn't ask a question yet. Um, thank you for the talks. Uh, I think your projects have been maybe at different risk levels between the different projects. And um, my question is a bit, at which point in your projects did you realize that this was going to be something big? And how did you feel about your maybe the progress of the project, if it goes, was going well or not so well, I guess that's a common state for PhD students. And at what, yeah, maybe at what point you notice this is going to work and this is going to be something, something really impactful. Anyone likes to answer this first? Mine didn't really work. <laughs> um, so y I guess you have to be quite flexible with with how how you approach your questions. Because, for example, I was I tried to look at um, those um, desert 
invertebrates, but I just couldn't find any. I, I just, there was just, yeah, there was just nothing there for me. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you quickly have to, well, I quickly changed to, to look at microbes instead. And I guess if you have a supportive lab, then it's pretty easy to then change and, and find the, find the additional resources and find additional collaborators who are willing to to join in and and help you but yeah I don't think I don't think you ever know it's gonna work <laughs> it's just it just it just happens and yeah and dif depends what you what you call working or <laughs> or a byproduct Annette wants to answer and also can you please speak up a bit so our online audience. Uh, at least I can tell about my experience. So now looking back, what really worked well for me was to have actually several projects running in parallel. So of course, for some project, nothing will work and at, the, at some point it will be dead end, but that's, some other will work. So I also on a daily basis, you feel that something is going because you have several projects and something will work on some project, you know? So also personally, like emotionally, you feel better because something works. Because if you work on one project and you're stuck, I think that's harder. But if you have several ones running in parallel, at least that helped me a lot. And the question when you know when something is big, it, it's hard to tell actually when. But for all my projects I have had in lab, it's always that we found something really interesting by chance. It has never been really at the beginning that we know, okay, we will do it this way. For example, also about nuclear lipid droplets, we found them by chance, not that we knew that we will find something like that. And also for the other projects I did in my PhD, everything happened by chance. You look at one thing and suddenly you found something else and from that thing you go further and then again you see, see something else. So it's never like an ending story. It's also never going from A to B, you know. You're going from A to something else. And yeah, I think the good strategy is to have several approaches and several projects, and then something will work at the end. <laughs> right, there was another question. Uh, so another question to Dasha, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because we're from the material engineering department, so we're interested in this kind of applicational stuff. Uh, so you mentioned something that you can use near infrared to reduce the amount of heat that you actually cause to the eyes, but you chose the other option, which you thought was easier. Uh, I don't know if it's an uh, idea that you're working on right now, so you can disclose, but uh, if you can, can you mention like uh, maybe briefly how can you do that simply? So there is, ah, thank you. Um, there is a relatively new field of uh, physics that I believe uh, emerged around 1990 with the very first theoretical papers called optical refrigeration or laser cooling. And the main idea there is that by taking a material where emission is blue shifted, more energy ends up leaving the material than uh, what you use to stimulate. The normal situation is emission is uh, red shifted. And so uh, blue shifted photons have more energy than red shifted photons. So if you blue shift the emission, more energy ends up leaving and temperatures end up coming down. The materials that have these properties are rare, they are harder to work with, and the probability of observing this particular transition is lower. So uh, the very first applied <coughs> papers are just now starting to come through, experimenting with different materials. Um, it's not quite at the stage now where we could use it translationally, but we are hoping that in the future, these materials, uh, so the range of these materials uh, will increase and we can start using this technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dasha. Another, any other questions? So maybe I take the next uh, question. Um, this might be a bit of a cliche question, but I really like it. Um, 
if you happen to meet a scientist, dead or alive, and not Schrodinger, who would you meet and why? reply with another cliche I guess <laughs> um, I, I just meet Darwin and hang out with him in on his journeys <laughs> look at all the all the now extinct species <laughs> yeah. have Darwin to look at invertebrates <laughs> he did he did he, he I think he has a he has a paper on the on like worms and the underground biota which obviously no one really not high impact, high impact. <laughs> no, no, probably not <laughs> So after thinking, I think I would meet uh, Thomas Young. Nobody knows Thomas Young. So he's the, he was one of the last people who worked in several fields and advanced several fields at the same time. So he lived in the early 19th century. He died more or less, I think he was 56 or something like that. And he was a very humble man. So he was, uh, they asked him to be president of the Royal Society and he declined. He proved that light was a wave. He did the crucial steps to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphs. He worked how the how focusing of the eye work, and he prescribed astigmatism for the first time. And he did all these things. And he got very little recognition. He wrote gigantic books that were failures. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> he, he was an extremely brilliant man and almost everything in his life was a failure. Um, so he wanted to be a doctor, as in a, a medical doctor, and that was his main degree. And he never succeeded at becoming established as a doctor, so he did all these other things. And he, he produced tons of breakthroughs in, in lots of fields, um, including... A, how you say, life insurance statistics, and all kinds of things. Um, and it's a kind of, uh, it's, it's what I, it has all the qualities I admire in a scientist. Um, he, his kind of life. And it's also, you know, if you read about him, you get this idea of uh, that things are about failing over and over and over and over, and still getting things done. So that's, that's where I would meet. Thank you, Adrian. Well, I guess he should be known about the double slit experiment, if nothing else. Yes. Mm. Another question, probably for Dasha. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> So we were at this PhD day done by Uppsala uh, University a few days ago. And uh, there was this talk about, uh, so they think that we will be succeed in our field if we like what we do. Uh, but then there was also this uh, PhD who became a professor in the end. He, he said that when he entered the field, he was aiming for the one which got the most uh, fundings, uh, you know, the forefront fields. So how do you find that balance between what you actually like to do and the forefront of the field where you get money and attention, let's say? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And start from the poor fields. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's start from the poor. <laughs> from the poor field. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I have friends who, who did that same thing. I looked up where the most funding is within biology and just went for a degree there. But I was, I was, I don't know. I thought that's such a, that's such a strange um, worldview. So yeah, I just remained in this uh, dirty old ecology. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's really hard because, like, you have to, you like, I don't know about you guys, but you you just really want to do what you like to do, you know, lab work or just digging digging around in the soil looking for anything that moves. Like that's what you want to do. That's where you want to be. But then, seventy percent of your time, you have to just 
try and sell yourself and like I, yeah I'm I'm really not good at it and you just constantly yeah feel like a failure a little bit <laughs> and and thinking about oh how should I sell this or how should what should be the selling point of this or how how should I get funding for these things which I know I love but I also know most people probably don't really care so I don't know for us it's just this constant battle of trying you know trying to feel relevant but you don't really want you know you just want to do what you do <laughs> so it's a it's a bit of a tricky one I think thank you Rosie. any of the rich fields <laughs> All right. Um, well, re uh, with this, maybe I want to finish with a yes and no question. Yeah, so that everyone can answer. Um, would you recommend your real or hypothetical kids or nephews or nieces to go into the field that you are? Yeah? Science in general, going to science or different disciplines? Would you encourage them, not tell them? Um. <laughs> yes, but not Okay. Science and your field? I think we need more people um, to, to develop new therapies. We desperately need more people and we need them to, to stick to, to do two things at the same time. So I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Will? <laughs> yes. It's hard to imagine a more fun job So, in that regard. No. Uh, I think yes. Yes, it's and quite yes. fun. Same, f also the field that you're in. You would. Oh, I know that. You mean the specific field? Or you mean science? Yeah, I mean science. Uh, I'm not two sure questions: the science the and the field. I'm not sure if the, if the field still exists when the nephews. <laughs> <are born>. <laughs> <laughs> I would encourage, but maybe not exactly in my field, but maybe something in between biology and medicine to have this more link to. Mm. to maybe some diseases and what really matters more. That's how I feel. <laughs> and I would say yes. <laughs> okay. Great. So we are right on time for our coffee break. Thanks so much, our winners. Again, a big applause for them. <laughs> so we'll, we will be back 20 past 2 for our keynote speaker. So please have your coffee break and be back at the uh, 20 past.
So in this last bit of our symposium, we are going to have our keynote speaker, Waldo Vinson, research editor in uh, Science Magazine. So I will introduce Waldo again, although only introduced for the new uh, participants. So Waldo did PhD in Johns Hopkins in chemistry, and then a postdoc in Johns Hopkins in cell biology, the focus of cytoskeletal proteins. We can easily call her a biophysicist. She is the editor of uh, Life Sciences in general in Science Magazine. And an important fact about her, she wanted to be a writer, and somehow she ended up to be a reader. <laughs> Valda, this is such a great pleasure to have you here. OK, thank you very much. and. Thanks to all our, our winners. Those were just amazing talks. Um, and I just realized five minutes ago that this is the first time I'm speaking in public in two years. So <laughs> um, but really glad to have you all here. And so today, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about, um, well, the title, Curating and Disseminating Research in a Challenging World. And basically, what I want to tell you about is a little bit about what publishing has been like, um, at least at Science, in the last two years since we dealt with the start of the pandemic. So I'll be focusing, of course, we haven't only been publishing COVID, um, thankfully. But um, at times, it felt like that was all we were doing. So today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about publishing um, during the time of COVID. And so first of all, let me just say thanks to what I'll call the COVID team. Um, we were, um, I have to especially say thank you to um, Caroline Ash, who is our, do I have a, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, and let me see, let me go back a slide. Um, Caroline is our infectious diseases editor um, and virology, and so she's been really handling uh, a huge number of papers. Um, and then on there are, are other editors of science who are in the fields of sort of biomedicine, uh, cell biology. It's really taken a big group. And then our insights team, um, led by Lisa, who publishes the com commentary side of the magazine. Um, Holden, our editor-in-chief, um, who's got the little inset there. And you may have read um, Holden's been sort of writing editorials um, that really challenge um, the policies uh, that, that, and, and sort of the, some of the misinformation that's happening right now. Um, and on, this, on the staircase, you see sort of the whole big team, all the journals uh, in the science family. So just to start off, just to set a little context, uh, we really... Um, pride ourselves on being a general interest journal, and we work very hard to make sure that we publish across a range of science. And so this is just our topical areas for 2019. Um, you see, you know, 7% for earth sciences, and the one I'll draw your attention to, microbiology and immunology, was 7%. And we try hard to maintain balance across fields. You know, we, we publish fields that get less well-cited as well as fields that get more well-cited. So that, that maintaining that diversity across fields is very important to us. But then the world changed in around March 2020, as I'm sure you all remember. And this is what we saw. Um, this is our submissions over time. Um, you know, with all that's been happening in publishing, we're watching these very carefully. Are we going to lose submissions? Um, you know, is, is publishing, what's happening in publishing, are things still okay? And then in 2020, we just saw the jump. And that's completely accounted for by COVID papers. So we got a flood of research papers. Um, in 2020, we, had, we got, we, we, we get, we got a total of about 13,000 papers, and of those, nearly 2,000 were on COVID. Um, we published 
86 COVID papers. Um, so that was 11% of all our publications. Um, I, I specifically haven't <laughs> given you the percentage of, of submitted because COVID papers are not at equilibrium. And this is measure, measure this, that, that number of submitted is, is the number of papers submitted in the calendar year, and the number of published is the number published in the calendar year. So they're not tracking the same papers. Um, and with COVID, it really matters because it's, it's not, most of our papers are kind of at equilibrium, so it doesn't matter, but not COVID. Um, in 2021, it's gone so far, we've had 724 submitted and we've published 74, um, which hopefully means that although the volume went down, the quality went up. But, um, so sort of what was the start of the timeline of COVID? Well, probably many people remember the first cluster was reported. Um, end of December 2019. Of course, it turned out that it had been around a little bit before then. Um, we got our first submission on the 6th of January 2020. It was probably an astronomist doing epidemiology, but I don't know for sure. Um, the coronavirus was sequenced on the 12th of January. Um, we published our first paper on the 19th of February, and that was the structure of the spike, um, the cryo-EM sp structure that came from Jason McClellan's lab. Um, and I, I think it's on the next slide, but I believe we published that in nine days. So the uh, pandemic was declared on the 11th of March, and this was, I think, is this our first cover? We did our first cover on the 27th of March. So, as we were suddenly getting so flooded with papers, um, what criteria were we using? Our normal criteria, of course, for papers is, you know, novelty is key. So, um, we, and in, and in this case, we felt like we couldn't really use exactly the same criteria because, um, you know, for example, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 had been solved. So you could make a very reasonable argument that solving another coronavirus spike protein was not a science paper. Um, but on the other hand, you could say, well, this is going to be the basis of the vaccines that saved the world. So it, it was, we found ourselves weighing, you know, different things like, is this a science paper? And we were discussing these issues. Um, so, but basically I think the criteria we were using was, is it actionable? Will it help society? What are the policy implications? Um, and what is the high technical quality? I mean, and, and, and sort of it had to have high technical quality as sort of the bar we set for all papers. Um, the, the policy implications ones, I think we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about I, as I go on. Um, I think as editors, you know, we felt, we felt ourselves in a very sort of a position of some responsibility, maybe even more so than we feel because of the fact we know we're impacting people's careers. Um, but this that you felt like you actually were in making decisions that might impact, you know, policies that affected whether people lived or not was really um, made me lose sleep at night. Um, so right at the beginning, though, um, we had published a policy forum um, called against pandemic research exceptionalism. So while I've told, while I've said, you know, we were using slightly different criteria, on the other hand, we strongly believed that there were no excuses for lowering scientific standards. So we were trying to publish this research. We wanted to publish actionable research in a timely way. We wanted to um, facilitate getting this work peer reviewed so that there was some validation. Um, but we didn't want to do it so fast that, um, that we took shortcuts um, and that, you know, this, this work was not as sort of validated as, as, as anything else we published. Um, so I've got a little slide in here that just sort of, this is just showing what, what, what are our normal criteria, how do we normally 
um, make, sort of try and make sure that what we're publishing is high quality, reproducible research. And I'm sure you've all heard of the reproducibility crisis. I'm sure you've all heard of the cancer papers that just didn't reproduce in, um, was the, published in eLife. And there's a lot of arguments to have around there. Um, there's also a lot to be said about judging 20 years ago now. But anyway, um, the things we require, you know, we're looking for reusable code, so we're looking for code deposition, the methods to be transparent so that a paper can be reproduced, uh, the data to be findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, that's the fair data. Um, on the one hand, so on the one hand, you're looking for availability of methods, code, data, and accessibility. On the other hand, in the sort of green, um, we're looking at the review process. So we're doing review by journal. Um, there's the preprint service, so there's some pre-submission review going on. And then, of course, we're always reliant to, I mean, science small s is always reliant to a certain extent on post-publication review. So we were trying to keep this all in place on our COVID papers. And now I'll just go through quickly just a few papers we did publish, just to give a sense of it. So as I said, was the first one was the spike protein, um, published after nine, published nine days after we got it, um, has already been cited more than 2,000 times. Um, and hopefully that just is a measure of how much it's been used. Um, and this one, you know, it, it wasn't difficult to publish this so quickly because everyone, scientists were all so eager to, everybody just wanted to do something to help back then. So when you, when I emailed someone and said, you know, we have the structure, can you review it quickly? They were like, yes, send it now. I'll have it back to you in five hours, <laughs> you know. So, um, so back then everyone was eager. So, so that, it, it wasn't a very hard task to do that quickly. Um, but since then, we've had many papers that were kind of just drawing the blueprints of um, the virus. I think, you know, in, this, in, the, in the US, the New York Times did a beautiful job kind of drawing out all the proteins involved, all the viral proteins. Um, but we've had many structures looking at how SARS-CoV-2 recognizes the human ACE2 receptor, showing how dynamic it is. There's, a, there's actually been a lot of sort of to and fro over how dynamic it really is, whether it's people's preparations or whether it's, but it, it certainly is a dynamic protein. Um, papers on the epitope landscape, so sort of really mapping all the epitopes on the spike protein and all the different antibodies that bind. Then of course, looking at all the variants and looking at the effect of those variants on ACE2 binding and the effect on all the antibodies binding. Um, and then we've also had the crystal structures of the, um, main protease, um, actually also there's a second protease, and the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and of course the main protease and the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase are the two big drug targets. Um, the polymerase is remdesivir and um, molnupravir, I might have a syllable missing there, and um, then the protease is the, the Pfizer drug, um, Paxlovid, I think it is. So uh, the first papers we got um, were the epidemiology papers, so people sort of modeling, you know, based on often kind of limited data. And at the time, it's, it's going to be interesting. I think there could be an interesting retrospective looking back at these papers and seeing, you know, how much they got right, how much they got wrong, how much was really useful, how much... Um, it's really been, I think, I think COVID has been an experience of science happening so fast um, that it's going to really present this case study in um, you know what worked and what didn't because normally the time scales are too long to really look at that so uh, this is going to be interesting but anyway um, we got this you know many epidemiology papers I've just called out this one because this gave an early warning um, that undocu that sort of of this asymptomatic spread, basically. 
Um, and then we had many papers modeling transmission dynamics um, <coughs> and, you know, many, and looking at sort of the effects of different um, interventions, the non-clinical interventions like social distancing, like masks, the effect of the immune response, that little antibody is supposed to remind you of the immune response. Um, and so, of course, how you modeled these things gave different answers, the curves looked different, um, and led to plenty of, there was plenty of room for valid scientific debate. Unfortunately, what happened and what we, um, what weighed on us very heavily was that we couldn't rely on these papers simply being um, a subject for valid scientific debate they became the subjects of really political debate. Um, and, I, I, you know, I was looking, I was, I was scrolling through Twitter just this morning, and I saw five different tweets about Omicron where we have really limited data. And the five tweeters, I kind of know what position each of these people came from. And for each of them, the Omicron data was solidly supporting their position. <laughs> so, um, I think we have to realize that scientists are, are not, um, you know, objective auto, automatons at all. We, we're people with the same um, biases and foibles as everyone else. And then, of course, there was um, the papers that led to drug development. So lots of antibody papers. Um, the first one up there is the um, Regeneron cocktail that famously went to a past president of the United States, um, but still it was a good study. Um, then we had um, uh, the vaccines, of course. So these are, these are sort of just call out papers. I've called out that antibody paper just because it was the first antibody cocktail that was um, approved for clinical use, or at least got an emergency use authorization. Um, then we have the vaccine papers. So this, this is a paper talking about um, immune correlates of the COVID vaccine. So, you know, people are all very interested in you vaccinate people. What does that do to their immune response? Um, and then the next one is a paper we recently published on um, the Pfizer drug that targets the main protease. And I mean, I think it's, you know, it's simply amazing to think that we published our first paper in, what was it, February or March of 2020, and by November of 2021, you know, we've published antibodies, vaccines, drugs. It's really just an amazing success story at, at that level. And then we have published several papers on understanding the biology. I mean, I think it's, when you look at these, it's interesting that, you know, the biology in some ways still lags behind. You know, when, when as someone who has more biophysicist training, um, it is, you know, we, we still don't understand that. I mean, really, we, we don't really know how it gets in. We kind of know it binds to ACE2 and then we know it. But, but, you know, when you start trying to ask details, you realize that, we don't actually know a lot of, of details. So some of the, there's been some sort of new insights into the biology. Um, there've been things like, um, this was the paper from um, Nevin Krogan was the corresponding author, looking at the sort of protein interaction network across coronaviruses to look at disease mechanisms. And then, um, of course, also sort of more about sort of understanding the, the immune response, looking at the effects of, inve of infection or, va or vaccination on immune responses. So all this um, new science has been learned in, in a really short period of time. Um, and I think it's, it's been amazing to be involved in and to, to watch how hard people have been working and how far we've come. Um, then we have a section of science um, that's more about commentary, that, that sort of comments on research. So we have insight, we have um, perspectives that are written by scientists and are normally about science papers, um, or they can be 
um, or we have letters that come from scientists. This is just showing an example of the debate um, on the origins of COVID-19, which became um, very, very fractious. And you know, we've published we've we've published a letter arguing that we, we published the letter that said that everything should be looked at and got used by certain groups to um, forward their agenda. Um, we recently published a, a perspective looking at early COVID-19 cases um, in Wuhan, um, saying it really does look like it's come from the Wuhan market, but um, there's, you know, there's been this, this debate going on. Um, and I think that as Holden wrote in one editorial, we, we really need to do away with the idea that science is a fixed set of facts and we need to do a better job of letting the public know that. Um, because I think that this, you know, a lot of this misinformation comes because there's still ongoing, really valid scientific discussions happening. And what it sounds like to the public is, um, oh, today you say one thing, tomorrow you're saying something else. And we sort of allow these fights to happen, or not these, we allow these debates to happen among scientists that end up looking like fights and, um, and just um, do more harm than good when they're going sort of unfiltered um, into the news. So, um, you know, we've been, I've talked a lot about how exciting this has been, um, how much we've, you know, at, um, how much we've published. But it still hasn't been, I mean, COVID, you know, if I showed this map to remind me of, of the inequity. Uh, if you look at Africa, they just, you know, the, the vaccine doses are way less than um, the global south as a whole. It's not done that well. Um, but you can see the, the patches that are just not as dark green as other patches. So there hasn't been equity in vaccine distribution. Um, also, if you look at scientific publishing, um, the scientific publishing is mainly in the US and Europe. Um, although that people in, other, in, in Africa, in the global south are deeply affected and there are scientists in those areas doing research. So I think um, speaking to ourselves, to, to myself as a publisher, we really have to be weary of the sort of um, helicopter science, we call it, where people are coming in and taking data from somewhere and sending in papers without really representation of the, of the countries involved. So just to go on, uh, as I've sort of alluded already, COVID research has had so much public interest that it's really highlighted um, what we do to make science, to make research accessible. I think um, partly why I wanted to talk about publishing during COVID is also because I think it really is sort of a spotlight on um, research as a whole. So what does making research accessible mean? Well, you need it to be accessible you know, to scientists in the field and more broadly. You want it to be accessible to educators and decision makers, and then you want it to be accessible to the public. So you basically see these radiating circles of accessibility. <laughs> and what I like to think, being in publishing, is that we are contributing to making the paper more accessible. So you could start off, any paper can go, well, not any paper, they actually have some um, filter there as well. But bioarchive or medarchive, any decent paper can go and be posted um, on bioarchive or medarchive if it's in the life sciences. Um, but I would say those papers are, they, they don't have a, any sort of stamp of approval that a reviewer, at least two or three peers have looked at it. So, um, so they're pretty, and they're hard to find. You know, there's just this, mass of papers. So how do you find the one paper you're interested in? Um, and you need to be expert to evaluate it. Then you go through review by experts and you've got some level of validation. So now scientists, maybe not in the exact field, could read it and say, 
okay, I don't understand this deeply enough to be able to validate it myself, but I feel a little bit secure because it has been peer reviewed. Um, and then we would hope at a place like science, we give input from the editor, and what we're hoping for there is to really make it readable by a broader. So we're not giving any further validation beyond the reviews, but we are hoping to make it readable by a broader scientific audience. And then it goes to our press office, and our press office is really presenting to a broad readership um, through the popular media. Um, and then you turn to what um, open access tends to focus on, um, on sort of gettability more than readability. Um, so, you know, I, would, uh, I always want to bring the other slide first because, because you can get something doesn't make it accessible to you. So, um, actually, so, so sort of to turn it around, we say, okay, it's findable, it's readable, is it available? Um, for our COVID papers, absolutely. All our um, COVID papers are public health are pu and the published version is free um, CCBY on our site. So it's in front of the wall. Um, but, you know, I'm sure everyone's heard of these different models. Um, we're at Green, where um, an open version of the paper can be archived. Um, Science Advances is at Gold, so that's an author pay model. Um, at science itself, most scientists have access through institutional licenses. Um, public health papers, I said, are free. Plan S papers, the accepted versions, free at a repository. We can talk about that if anyone doesn't know more about that. But I would say that, um, you know, publishing costs, if you think there's value to, you know, using this funnel to really get the paper validated, more accessible to a broader readership, the, um, the sort of the framework to actually get it out there, um, that costs money. So um, we do that at the moment through sort of a, a subscription or membership model. Um, you could do it through an APC. Um, but I think that, you know, the question you need to ask is how much money is the publisher making? Open access models can also make a lot of money. So um, I think the, the, it, it's an interesting question to ask whether it's for profit or not for profit and not so much, you know, which, which publishing. People have, people have focused very much on I think there's a problem and this is what I think the answer is rather than this is the problem, let's discuss how we solve this problem. Um, so just sort of as a, as a takeaway there, the way I see things are we have the scientists at the top, they can post their papers to preprint servers, um, they can publish their papers in a journal, and the hope is that as it goes through this process, um, it gets more and more accessible to a broader readership. Um, some scientists are also really good at tweeting, but we can't use that as what every scientist has to be able to do. Um. <coughs> so, as, as I've talked about, you know, and, and um, you know, we've seen now there's all these different methods for dissemination. There are the preprints, there, are the tweet, there, there is Twitter, there is Facebook, and then there's the journals coming in, and then there's the newspapers coming in, and the newspapers might be going straight to the preprints. So, how do we, what does this mean for public science debate? You know, preprints and Twitter mean that scientists are out there debating it themselves. Um, Anti-science forces have been using this to exploit disagreements. Um, so should we shelter our debates? And um, Holden has written some editorials on that. Our view is no. You should, you, you should be having the debates. You should be having them openly. We need to be have, you know, these debates need to be happening, but we need to be think, ab think about what we're doing. You, you don't want to just be, oh, gosh, I hate what this person is saying. You have to be thinking when you're scientists, you're debating each other and realize the world is watching and have that debate in a responsible way. Um, and I would say we need gifted science communicators. You may not be the gifted science communicator, but someone who can understand what you say is 
And so you need to be really giving um, you know, the food, the, the content to the, the scientists who really are the good communicators and let them be the voice of science. Um, so I want to just sort of throw things around a little bit. And I know I hear a lot about, oh, what are these journals doing? Um, this is a waste of our money. I've put, I've put all this time in, let, let me just be in my lab doing the work. I don't need all this nonsense of having to prepare for this journal or that journal. Or, and I would say that we've got into this mess of misinformation, partly because scientists don't care enough about communicating their work. They think that doing the work is enough. And I want to challenge you and say it's not. You have to learn to communicate your work well. And you don't have to be the world's greatest communicator, but you need to accept that you're going to have to take the time to really write this, you know, to really write a good paper, if that's still our mode of, of um, communication, to accept that if you still believe in journals, that journals are going to have to put time and effort into making this paper hopefully even better, and you're going to work with them through that. Um, and then, you know, we're going to put something out there and hope that we have something that can be understood by the journalists, that can be understood by the scientists that are the really good public communicators. Um, so that's just to turn it around a, lo a little. I'm not saying that there's nothing to criticize about the journals. That's just to flip it a little bit. Um, so what have we learned from COVID? Um, we've learned it takes a team. Um, you know, a lot of our papers on COVID have been very multidisciplinary. Um, and when they haven't, it's been problematic when you have someone from another field just swooping in and, and you know, especially epidemiology. Everybody thinks they can do epidemiology. Um, so it takes sort of all these scientists working together. Review remained very important. So um, the preprints, I think, played an important role because the preprints made the work available immediately um, to, to other scientists. And in fact, when the preprints really started working better through COVID, that took some of the pressure off of us because we didn't feel like, oh my goodness, we know this, this is so important. This has to get out there tomorrow. Um, Who will review this to me, for me tonight? So it kind of took that pressure off. The paper's out there for the scientists who really need it, and now we need to validate it and um, get it out in the journal to a, to a broader readership. Um, I think as curators, we need to really think about diversity. Um, it is absolutely one of the big, and, and I just brought this in here a little bit, looking at that map of and, and sort of the, the lack of representation from, from Africa. Um, but I think in general, yes, there's a big problem that if, if you look at papers we publish, the strongest bias is toward um, top tier institutions. So, and maybe that's expected, but still we have to, we have to do what we can to really work on that kind of problem. How do we enhance diversity? And then we've learned that you know, science really needs to be communicated. Um, it can be messy, but we need to be as open as we can. Um, and, but really focus on the information we're getting out there, not on making ourselves look like the cleverest person in the room. Um, and then we need to support scientists who use a megaphone well. There are scientists who really are good communicators, and we need to give them our support. We don't all have to be that person. Um, so thank you. And hopefully I was a little controversial. And just, uh, you know, I don't mind controversial questions at all. So go right at it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Falda. So, questions? Go ahead, Will. <laughs> Sorry, were there, were there any papers you regretted publishing? Um, you mean through COVID? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really even know that. Um, we, I mean, we have had papers, some of these modeling papers, um, we have had papers that have come under a lot of attack. Um, but to this day, I'm not sure 
if the paper's really flawed or if they're always getting attacked by what we have a paper that was um, you know the, the impact of non clinical interventions in Germany. Everybody attacking it is German. And so I don't know. I mean, if, it, if it was the United States, I would know if the, I would be able to go and Google and see are these is this all the right wing coming, but but I can't there, so I, I'm still sort of a little and we we ask experts is this paper fundamentally flawed? And they're going, they go, well, not really, but they didn't really have enough data, and there's a lot of, um, so, you know, it's, yeah, it's complicated. Do you, sometimes I wish I hadn't published it. Sorry, one more. Yeah. We need for, for the broadcast. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh -huh. Is there a science policy for scientists expressing uh, views using their um, academic titles in fields? that are like not in their own field? If they just use their oh. professor professorship in something, although it's totally unrelated to what they're expressing. Yeah, you, you mean, um, so, so like for somebody has a courtesy title somewhere? No, more if they are saying something about epidemiology when they are a geologist and they write that they are a professor just to get an audience, right, or be yeah. credibility, but they should have no credibility at all in that field. Yeah, I, I think that um, we would make them declare their full affiliation so that it would be clear that, but, but I mean, I don't think any of those papers have gotten into science. No, okay. Yeah. Thinking that the general public will not Maybe know the difference. Yes, I mean, and, and that is a real, th there, there is, um, some of our, our sort of technical comments that we have gotten in have been, um, but it's, it's difficult but because um, a lot of them come from astronomers who use a similar math, right? So they claim that they are experts. So it's, yeah, it gets difficult. Sort of related to the public communication part, also. But do you ever consider con creating like a non-technical review article that would convey some of the results, but in an authoritative way for a lay audience? Like, like rather than letting the New York Times make the map of all the yeah. Teams? I mean, we've we've talked about that, but there are people. The the problem is, who are we pitching that at? Because our readership is scientists and to um, you know to, to take science and make a much broader readership read it that's very challenging um, and and there are people who do it like Carl Zimmer at the New York Times does it really well yeah. Um, so yeah, so I guess, and it takes a lot of money to do that really well and you have to have good writers right you, you know there are not many scientists who could write that way. Uh, so you need someone who's a really... We do have a news team, so we do do some of that that our, you know, our news reporters do. But we've talked a lot about, you know, do we do that next level kind of review written by scientists, but that's more sort of scientific America type level. But it's just, you, you need to then develop a whole product that's... And it all costs money. You, you can't give this all away. <laughs> but can, can I ask... Uh -huh. One question related to this. Uh, yeah. Wouldn't it be a viable option to have a, a paragraph, a layperson paragraph for each paper published in science? You know, you have an abstract so we do. highlights, but a layperson. Well, we, we there is supposed to be a layperson's paragraph for each paper uh, that's only about 100 words long that's written by the editor. Okay. And it's there with each paper. I, it's, it's very... Um, general, so I'm not, a slightly longer piece that you don't see um, is written by our press office, and that's normally somewhere between 150, maybe up to even 200 words, um, and the editors check those, um, but that goes out, so science has a press package, so if a sci um, science publishes on Thursday at 2 o'clock, on Sunday a press package goes out, 
um, to sort of the whole of AP, Associated Press. And um, that's got summaries of not all the papers, but many of the papers. So that's how reporters choose papers to cover. In, in, in relation to that, I was thinking, because another problem is there are science sections in newspapers, but the people who write those articles are not scientists. And they're very sensationalist kind of people. Right. Sometimes they have degrees in other things. And so they try to, you know, give it the edge. For instance, when we published my paper, practically all the reviews was about the spreading. And it was trying to tie it with the naughty sailors that went overboard. And it was sort of word games and right. making it sound very saucy. Right. And right, all right. the other, the actual science was not really featured. It was more about the maps because that's what people the maps would, and it would, yeah, yeah, it, would yeah. it would catch people's eyes. Yeah. But I was thinking, so the thing is, if you have these reviews at science, people won't go into science to read them. And if you have newspapers, you don't have science, you know, scientifically right. trained writers. But you could sort of partner with a newspaper that you that 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 you know AAAS particularly likes, and they could fund sort of one or two general audience science writers which are paid by triple as but they are published in i want to say in a newspaper but right. a very widely read newspaper and then you have sort of had the so it's good for the newspaper as well because people will sort of they will know who's writing if you can negotiate this to actually happen <laughs> no that's an interesting idea do you know there is a thing called um the conversation oh, yes. yeah okay. so yeah um yeah, it's mainly read by scientists, but so the conversation is a um, it's a publication where scientists write, and uh, you can sort of write a pitch about your own paper. So if you have a paper that you think is kind of newsy, you can pitch the scientists and write your own piece in the conversation. I mean, I think that the the problem is that we overestimate how interested people will be if we could just tell them the, the interesting part of the science and not the sexy part, right? I think the sad thing is that they actually won't be that interested. But um, it's worth a try. Um, so that's why people have to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that's why what, what we underestimate is, and what science, where science can have a role, is really getting this out to scientists. Because every scientist has has a community that they interact with that are non-scientists. And so I think sometimes you try too hard to jump from, you know, the middle of this circle to the middle of that circle, and you can't do it. What you need to do is get from here to here and then hope that person is going to take you the next step. So um, I think communicating science to scientists and, and scientists being interested in reading outside of their fields um, so that they can um, then be ambassadors to the next circle of people. I think that's what's, that's important. And we've lost that to a certain extent. Um, you know, like all the old guys said, when you lose print, you lose the browsing. And so um, we got to get back that sort of scientist's interest outside of their own fields. Can I have one last question? Um, yeah, please. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Um, I think I'll continue with the topic of communicating your science to the world or scientist community or more random people, maybe. Um, so I understand the need of being a good communicator. I also agree with this, of course, but I'm thinking that communication skills are quite specific and particular. Some of us might be really good communicators, like naturally skilled, but maybe some of us might not be that good. It might be possible to train these skills to a certain extent. But now I'm also thinking maybe more um, of private companies or administrative bodies. I think over the past years, we have seen a rise in new functions or jobs like social media communication officer or the fancy names, I don't know exactly. But to me, it's the sign that's taking care of the communication social media does represent a lot of time 
and maybe we have to appoint someone in a lab team, I don't know, specifically for this work, and being able to communicate both with the scientific community or maybe more, I mean, people that are less aware of science. Yeah, yeah I think that's a very good point. And, and I think that that's sort of related to, I mean, my, my view of it is that not all of us can be those great communicators, but then whoever, so maybe that can be, but yes, you could have it be someone's job, like, you know, I have the job of being an editor, and so you could basically make this curation job for social media, which is, it would be a similar, we can do something, but we can never be the expert, because by definition of our job, we have to be very broad. And so we're trying to learn about a lot of different things. I think the importance of those scientists who are not going to be the communicators, but realizing that their work is going to get communicated. And so it's very important for them to state things accurately. To You don't have to say it in a way that's, you know, that's going to be, that, that the world is going to enjoy reading. But you need to say it in a way that that scientist one step away who is a good communicator, who reads what you've done, is going to understand it. You know, that what I'm saying is you put the work into, so you've, you know, just simple things like, um, I think, you know, like back to reproducibility, like, like is the method section, when you're thinking of papers, you know, is the method section um, good enough? Is the introduction clear? Is there a clear conclusion? Is there all these things that make it, easier to be communicated to other scientists. And if you don't do that bit, then your next levels out are never going to be any good. So, so all I'm saying is that all of us, well, me, I can, my job is slightly different, but all of you can work to make that initial reporting as good as it can be. Right. Thanks so much for that. <laughs> okay. Very insightful. We really appreciate it. So we are towards the end of our event. To have some closing remarks, I am inviting Johan Elf, a uh, Scilab Lab group leader. Johan. Thank you very much. I will try to speak in here. Um, before I thank all of you, uh, I would just like to um, uh, show a little bit of an um, information about a new great program from Scilab Lab, uh, founded by the Wallenberg Foundation uh, in data-driven life science. And especially since we have a young audience here and online, uh, I would encourage you to go to the website and check this program out. Uh, especially there is a big recruitment of uh, research leaders um, over the next 12 years. So there will be uh, 39 uh, associate assistant professor level recruitments with big uh, recruitment packages. So uh, five year funding, um, 17 million Swedish crowns, and that will cover then uh, several PhDs and postdoc positions for these group leaders. So check this out. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to Thank all the speakers, the prize winners, for amazing lectures. Very great science. It's fun to see actual talks again. And um, a special thanks to um, Science and Valda, your team, for selecting these people. You're doing a great job, obviously. I think we have a... Yes. Should I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. Sit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, should I, um, yeah, Ed Lynch, uh, where are you? Yes, okay, yes. I would like to thank you also for thank you. brilliant work today. Thank you so much. Um, also, a great thanks to uh, the Wallenberg Foundation for funding uh, this event and this whole week and the prize. And uh, also to the uh, great SciLife Lab uh, organization team, Enrica, for making this week happen. 
and everyone involved in that also. So a big, big hand to everyone. Thank you.